Happy to Oh, you did? All right, great. So um, I'm going to call this uh, regular meeting of council for October 15th, 2018 to order. And Judy, if you could uh, please do our roll call. You bet. Housh. Here. McQueen. Here. Hempfling. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Also present are village manager Patty Bates, village solicitor Chris Connor. We have with us Colleen Harris, the finance director, oh, Johnny nice Burns, public works director, and Denise Swinger, planning and zoning official. Okay, great. Um, and do I understand we have a special announcement? I believe we do. Okay. Yeah, if you would, <laughs> would mind coming to the mic? I'm excited now. Hi, I'm Brian Potts, and I'm here on behalf of Beth Rubin, the director of Greene County Department of Job and Family Services. Beth apologizes for not being able to make it tonight, um, and thanks you for letting me fill in. Uh, we're residents of Yellow Springs, and very appreciative of the support villagers have shown for social services in Greene County, and for the children's services levy in particular. Job and Family Services covers a wide variety of programs, including adult protective services, child support, workforce development, public assistance, and protective children's services. One in four Ohioans is connected in some fashion with Job and Family Services in a year's time. Whenever they're looking for a new job, navigating nursing home care for a loved one, or calling about a vulnerable, vulnerable neighbor, the agency's work impacts families, businesses, the local economy, and the community as a whole. Today I'm here to talk specifically about the department's largest program, Green County Children's Services, and the local levy, Issue 6. This is a renewal, no new taxes, no increase. Children's Services is designated by law to provide for the care, protection, and placement of abused, neglected, and dependent children in Green County. The agency works to protect children from abuse and neglect through safety assessments, as well as foster care, adoption, kinship care, and independent living programs. In 2017, the agency served over 2,000 children through prevention, protection, placement, and permanency programs. 228 children received placement services, 40 children were reunified subsequent to placement, another 33 children were placed in the custody of other family members subsequent to placement, a total of 15 adoptions were completed. Currently, 144 children are in the agency's custody, with 32 of those children in permanent custody. Five are in adoptive placements awaiting finalization. 27 are available for adoption. While Job and Family Services relies on state and federal funds to run the majority of its programs, the Children's Services Division is different. Local levy funds make up 63% of the program's budget. In addition, the local levy dollars are needed in order to access state and federal dollars through reimbursements and matching funds. Green County Children's Services is seeking a renewal of an existing 1.5 mil levy for five years, again, issue six. This renewal will not increase taxes. The levy's sole purpose is to support children's services. The funds are spent solely on the protection of children in our community. Child abuse and neglect affect everyone in the community. We need to act now to maintain current programs that keep our community's most vulnerable citizens, our children, safe. It takes a community to protect a child, and with your help, there is hope. Please support Issue 6 for Children's Services. If you have any questions, I will be sure to pass them on to Beth, and she'll get back to you with answers promptly. She's good that way. Um, if you need to contact her directly, you can do that through the Greene County website. Just follow the links to Java Family Services. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, is it correct that next month is Adoption Awareness Month? Okay, great. Um, I mean, I know that's not all that you do, but we appreciate the great work. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, do we have any other announcements? Yes, I have two announcements. Okay. Um, our mayor has uh, recently made a proclamation uh, in observance of October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I thought it was especially important to point this out given the current uh, focus on not just domestic violence, but violence in particular against women. Uh, so I'll read the proclamation is on the bulletin board outside the uh, council chambers. Um, the mayor wrote, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month in our country. 
the village mayor's office has joined the rest of Greene County in issuing a proclamation to this effect, noting that community leaders, police, judges, advocates, health care workers, and concerned Yellow Spring citizens are joining others across our country and our country to develop solutions and services to this serious problem. The next announcement that I have to make also um, involves violence, or hopefully prevention of violence, at the national level by uh, our, uh, what does ICE stand for? Whatever ICE stands for. Immigration. 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 Custom, Custom, Custom enforcement. enforcement. Yeah. Previously, ICE was only uh, going 100 miles from the border of the country to apprehend uh, immigrants who are here undocumented. Now it's apparently they have come into Dayton to get people and mm. potentially Springfield. There is a local uh, Yellow Springs effort called Building a Sanctuary Support Network and they are having a program on Saturday, this Saturday at 7 p.m. at Rockford Chapel. And I will be attending that. And just so people are aware, Yellow Springs passed a resolution in 2017, uh, which while not the ex saying that we are a sanctuary city, reinforced our village as a welcoming village and that our police do not uh, pick up innocent, do not pick up people who are not breaking the law, regardless of what their status is. Mm -hmm. Marianne, could you re yeah. repeat when the event is at Rockford yes. Chapel? It's this Saturday. Just for the audio, thank you. This Saturday at 7 p.m. at Rockford Chapel. And there will be a speaker, Joel Miller, who's the pastor of the Columbus Mennonite Church, which is offering sanctuary. He will be the featured speaker. Thank you. Okay. Patty, did you say you had an announcement? Uh, I do. I have two quick ones. Okay. Um, October is also Breast Cancer Awareness Month, obviously a you know, topic near and dear to my own heart. And I would like to wish a belated happy birthday to our clerk of council, Judy Kempner. Happy birthday, Judy. Happy happy birthday. Birthday. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, are those, are those flowers still uh, They're hanging going right strong? in there. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, and Patty, thanks for representing the village at the uh, Circle of Victory Absolutely. walk. Um, just a few other things that I wanted to mention. Um, so I heard from the CDC that it's a uh, flu season. So <laughs> think about whether you should get your uh, flu shot or not. Um, uh, I also just found out there's been some questions about our active transportation plan. And I got confirmation from Tool Design that we will have a final draft or actually final plan um, at our second meeting in November. Um, so November 19th, the uh, Yellow Springs Active Transportation Plan will be unveiled. Um, I also wanted to mention that this weekend uh, kicks off with Art Stroll. That's always the Friday after Street Fair. That's uh, an event that uh, the Yellow Springers covet uh, to sort of uh, take some deep breaths after street fair, which I think was very successful this year. And um, then over the weekend, we have open studios, 28 artists, 16 local studios, great event, um, uh, uh, lots of fun stuff to see. And then Patty, do you wanna uh, remind us about Halloween? Uh, yes, that is the 31st from six to eight. Okay, great. That is a Wednesday. All right. So everybody uh, get lots of good candy and uh, remember they'll have, we'll have lots of trick-or-treaters out and about. Something else? Okay. Um, so uh, we've got an, a, a consent agenda that has our minutes from the last meeting and also uh, the first reads of several ordinances which are updates to the zoning code. Um, there was something that explained it all in our packet. Remember, we have a second read for all of these. So uh, I will ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. I so. move to approve the consent agenda. And as the liaison to Planning Commission, I can say that much time was devoted onto all these uh -huh. changes in ordinance, both by our planner and by the Planning Commission. 
Okay. I second that motion, and I'm sure there was a great deal of work done. <laughs> okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, and a review of the agenda. Any things we need to change, add, uh, take off the agenda? Um, I think I will just highlight, uh, you know, I've had a commitment since I started as council president to try to keep our meetings um, to a timely uh, manner. And, uh, you know, again, we you know, had some comments about uh, trying to stay on schedule. So we are going to sort of continue those efforts and try to really stick to uh, some of the times that have been allocated here, uh, keeping in mind that conversations can continue if uh, we don't, you know, if we're not able to complete them in a certain meeting. So with that, uh, Marianne, if you want to do the uh, petitions and communications. Yes. Uh, we had a uh, communication from the Ohio Municipal League about State Issue 1 opposing it. We had early voting information from the Board of Election, and early voting takes place uh, at the Ledbetter <coughs> Road in Xenia during the day, during the week, and on the weekends to some extent. Uh, Green County Public Health had several press releases. One involves the Women, Infant, and Children program. They're uh, hosting classes on infant feeding, both for women in that program, as well as any woman who is expecting or has a small ch child. There was a press release. There have been two additional findings in Fairborn of the West Nile vi vi virus, and that has been treated. Then there's a contest uh, for youth about billboards for teen driver safety, but Yellow Springs is not participating. So, <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> uh, Green County is updating people uh, regarding hepatitis A. There have been some in instances in Green County, so they want people to be aware of that. Uh, the village manager uh, had a notice to the community that the average temperatures over the past three months, was that through September, I suppose? Mm -hmm. Through September, were the highest on record for the state of Ohio, dating back to 1895. Then we had uh, communication from the children, is that the, the Green County Citizens for Children's Services? We heard the presentation on that. <coughs> That's uh, issue six. Vicki Hennessy, who's the chair of the Glass Farm Management Conservation Area Committee, is requesting a modest budget uh, line item to help uh, man take care of some issues on the glass farm. And Den Denton Brookshire had a letter of commendation for Officer Charles, uh, who, who helped him with the concern that he had. Great. Um, so I, a question about uh, the request for the glass farm. Is that going to come up during yes. Yes. Uh, commissions or? It'll, during the budget. Okay. During the budget discussion. Okay, great. Okay. And um, the second thing is, and we kind of referenced this before, but actually it was Kevin that brought to our attention the o OML uh, thoughts about issue one. Um, and I agree with what I heard at the last meeting that probably we don't need to pass a resolution or get involved in that. However, I would like us to have a better understanding what's date, what Dayton is doing with decriminalizing uh, marijuana. Um, and uh, I think that may be something that might be more relevant for us. So if somebody could kind of check that out and give us an update. Who, who would that somebody be? Um, I, uh, Alice Jacobs has been raising that at the JSTF. Okay. And um, so I think you know, he could be a good resource. It would be helpful. Will you talk to, talk to him sure. about that? Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, 
So let's move into uh, legislation. And first of all, we have the uh, second reading for Ordinance 2018-35. And um, Judy, I guess well, let's go ahead and read it in full. All right, this is repealing Section 1040.12, Utility Roundup Fund, and enacting new Section 1040.12, entitled Utility Roundup Program, creating a utility roundup program. Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs accepts payments from customers for each of its utilities, and whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, through Ordinance 2018-34, established a fund whereby utility customers can choose to overpay their utility bills by rounding their payments up to a whole dollar amount, and such overpayments are then allocated to a designated fund with monies held for the benefit of qualifying utility customers of the village who are in need and who request financial assistance in paying, back a, t paying a delinquent utility bill, and whereas new Section 1040.12 establishes the program whereby funds may be administered. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that Section 1, a utility roundup program, is hereby enacted to read as set forth in the attached Exhibit A. Section 2, the Village Finance Director shall establish procedures relating to the administration of the utility roundup program. Section 3, this ordinance shall take effect at the earliest time allowed by law. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move to approve this. Second. second. Okay. Um, Marianne, why don't you just give us the, uh, the highlights and then we'll open. Lisa. Oh, Lisa? Okay, yep. Lisa. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So um, the Utility Roundup uh, program is an opt-in program. We've talked about it a couple times. Um, the idea is that you can opt in on your utility bill uh, to round up your payment to the nearest dollar, but you can also um, write in an additional amount. I'm very grateful to members of the community who've already reached out to us indicating their interest in donating additional amounts. Um, because this is a community supported program, we are also preparing a matching grant for the Yellow Springs Community Foundation. I'd like to thank the staff of the village and um, uh, Kevin, um, as well as uh, Tim Baum, who's a member of the HRC, who's been very pivotal because the devil's in the details. And so what you'll see in the packet tonight is some additional um, policies uh, about how this is administered. So I'm very excited that this program that's been talked about for a long time is becoming real. And uh, my focus, and I think Kevin's, uh, from now until the end of the year will be to reach out to community members and ask for their generous donations for those who can afford it because this program will only be effective if people can help support other people. That's what this is about. So thank you for the work to make this happen. And Colleen, thank you. All right, thanks, Lisa. And actually, uh, you know, I think part of the reason why I thought about Mary Ann is because we have been talking about this for a couple of years now, and uh, I appreciate that everybody's been on board to make it happen. Great. Patty? And actually, I see Chrissy sitting here tonight, and this was actually, Chrissy was the one who originally brought this idea up at an HRC meeting many moons ago. Uh, so Chrissy is, uh, needs to be acknowledged here as well. I should also say that she also has a more informal um, group that has been doing this for ever since she brought the idea up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a second reading, so I will open the public meeting for any questions or comments. That's right. part of why I came, Chrissy Cruz. Right. That's part of why I came to the meeting. I've been away for a while, and the first thing um, I read when I got back was the council meeting packet, and I was so excited mm -hmm. and happy to see that you had um, this ordinance. And I just wanted to say that it really pleases me and thank you all very much for doing it. It's so important. And it's gonna really help a lot of people. And when I read that, it made me really feel like a big welcome home. And so thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Chris. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, well with that, I'll just say Opt in. <laughs> and Judy, if you could call the roll. Indeed. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hemflin. Yes. Hausch. Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, we also have a second reading, reading of Ordinance 2018 38. And uh, um, 
I, th I think we can do title only. We read it in last time. Mm -hmm. This is repealing old section 288.01 of s chapter 288.01 of the Public Art Commission Establishment and Purpose of Title Eight Boards and Commissions of Part Two Administration Code of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new chapter 288.01 Arts and Culture Commission Establishment and Purpose. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Lisa. Yes. This is a fine tuning of the mission statement of the Art and Culture Commission. And I think what's really different about it is the um, way that it describes that art and culture are a way to support the village values, to support activism um, in various forms. I was um, really moved by a community member who came to an art and culture commission meeting this last week. and. Um, he said, you know, a lot of people come to Yellow Springs, uh, a lot of tourism, people come to Yellow Springs, and they come because Yellow Springs has a certain reputation and persona for free thinking. But at a certain point, you know, just tie-dye isn't going to tell the story of the vision that we see in Yellow Springs. And instead, if there's arts in the background, how can art that's in the background of the selfie help to shape the way people think about culture, help to shape the way people think about policing and the way people think about community. And that the images of art can be very powerful in shaping and reshaping our culture. And that's something that the Art and Culture Commission is really focused on. Not just having, you know, pretty art and fun, you know, images, but how can we really support the village values um, through art and culture and when people come to our community um, help to shape the way they think so I really appreciated that yeah and uh, and I really also appreciate that you know the mission's been expanded beyond arts to think about the cultural aspects as well mm -hmm. and ultimately you know the the message that we're sending um, so Judy I just wanted to clarify we had kept Public Art Commission as the title of this commission. So, I mean, it looks to me like we are making it yeah, clear it's, that it's the Arts and Culture Commission. I yeah. didn't know if that was in, uh, yeah. But just as long as. Uh, let me ch yeah, let me check. Okay. Mm -hmm. But just so that's clear. Yeah. Um, and otherwise. Do, uh, we, do we want to amend it if it was not kept as? This is the time. Yeah, well, it at yeah. least says that the new one is the Arts and Culture Commission, so I think we're okay. Um, but I, I didn't didn't know if we had forgotten to update the title before. Um, but this is a second reading, so I'm going to open a public hearing. Any questions or comments about this update to the Arts and Culture Commission purpose statement? Okay. If not, uh, Judy, could you call the roll? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Humphling? Yes. Krieger? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh. Yes. All right. And finally, we have the first reading of Ordinance 2018-39. Uh, Judy, title only is fine. All right. I got a little carried away with the Village of Yellow Springs here, so I got one, <laughs> caught one of those. <laughs> this is approving the 2018 Supplemental Appropriations for the third quarter for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. Colleen? Okay, the supplemental that I um, have in your packet tonight is to put back a little bit more additional funds that we needed in our current budget. Um, in the general fund, we needed uh, 10000 for uh, a part-time employee that moved to a full-time status, so it replaces that full-time status line item. Planning has, um, we'll need 3000 for the legal expenditures. Then the special revenue funds in the street, we did not have the sidewalk repairs in the original budget, so I'm asking for 25000 increased in the street department. For parks, again, it's a payroll uh, personnel. We did have a little shortage on our estimated wages. Again, we're doing this process this time of year for a whole year, and it's always um, easy to underestimate in some areas. Uh, most of them are pretty historically the same. 
In the enterprise funds, the largest one that you see is the electric fund, and I'm asking for 200000 to finish the debt payments that will be due for our electric use, 25000 for additional chlorine that was unanticipated with the new water treatment plant. He needs additional there. Wages for water treatment and sewer treatment, 20000 in each of those, um, and I'll explain that um, difference. Water treatment then and sewer treatment, an additional $250, or $250 for uniforms for a new employee. The total that I'm asking to increase our appropriations is $308,700. And I'm sure I have questions coming. Okay, Lisa? Um, yeah, I'm just um, wondering, there's three items that I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about um, uh, the first one is the 200000 in the electric fund. Um, if you can explain a little bit more about that, just because it's such a significant amount. And then also, there's two $20,000 line items, one in water and one is sewer, that's under estimated wages and wage adjustments. And just in the, in the sake of preventing underestimation in the future, if you could say a little bit more about those two as well, please. Sure. And I'm going to address the wages first. Thank you. I went back and looked at some history, and most of the additional monies that I'm asking for is for um, an employee turnover from this year. And when we have employee turnovers, obviously in the budget, we budget for a, an employee being here for the whole year. And if an employee does leave, it can create a cash out of their accrued benefits. And that has, that is the majority of these two larger um, amounts in the wages. Now in my 2019 budget, you're gonna see the wages are up higher on every fund. And that is because we put a 10% across the board for each employee in anticipation of anybody leaving. So we are not going to be short. If it doesn't get used, it doesn't get used. So a cash out of accrued benefits, you mean like uh, vacation time? If an employee had a vacation on the books or um, a portion of the sick leave on the policy that they're allowed to have if they leave, that um, generates an unanticipated an, an expenditure. It could be a small that normally it doesn't show up because we can handle it with our current budgets. This particular one, uh, most of it was from cash out. The other is a shortage in those areas because of the new water plant. And Johnny is here to help me with the history to help explain the additional on the wages and the electric. Because he's been here for the whole year and I wanted to make sure that we could get those two answered. Is there any other questions before Johnny helps me on the electric? I just want to ask Patty, you sent us an email about <coughs> someone Retiring and needing, is this what's These, covering no, that? No, this is not that one. This is actually a, a, a water and sewer plant operator who left uh, for another position. Um, but um, there, there was a cash out involved in that um, that we didn't anticipate. And then there was um, a period of time where we were paying a little bit more time because we were an operator short till we got the new one in. Um, so that the ones that you're talking about will be there in Colleen's budget that she's going to present to you tonight for next year. Okay. As a safety cushion. Okay. Well, and while we're talking about it, so <coughs> vacation and sick days, are, are they all, they're considered the same? The vacation, if an employee leaves, they get paid any vacation they have on the books, any personal time they have on the books, and if they uh, leave in good standing, they get a quarter of the sick time. They have a quarter? On the books quarter of the sick time they have on the books. Okay. And we as a staff have started talking about the impacts that that can have on the village and on the budget. So we may be bringing to council some changes in the personnel manual as far as that is. Because it is a financial liability for the village, the way the, some of the way that it reads right now. Right. And do we, I mean, do we account for that? It was not in your 2018 budget, and historically, I don't think that was ever really accounted for. Okay. When some people leave, they don't. Not everybody has a lot of accrual time. Okay. So it it only it, it's hard to budget. So in next year's budget, we're gonna I have a 10% kind of average for every fund, 
again, it's to put in there in case of it. It is our responsibility. If it's not used, then it just stays in the bank. So, and I'll explain that on the budget. It's just an increased amount of wages I'm asking for in 2019 to cover if anybody does leave. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll ask you about it when we talk about okay. it then. Okay. Any other questions from council? Um, Jeff. So we've got Johnny. All right. <laughs> Okay, let me address the wages. On top of that, we're firing up the new water plant, getting it all started. We've had major issues and pumps going out, so the guys have also had to come in Ooh. and the overtime to try to fix the pump to make sure the water is running. So that's time that we also did not see in 17 when we was preparing for 18's budget. And that has a lot to do with the $20,000 on each fund going over. Um, <clears throat> to get back to the Electric Fund, AMP presented a uh, package to us in 2016, uh, projected 17, 18, 19, and 20 s budget. When uh, the last financial director and myself looked at the budget uh, in 17, that's the best guess that they had, we put it in 18's budget. They come back in February and presented a whole nother thing to Patty I and uh, the financial director, and that had increased $74,000 can't do nothing about that they we they predicted it we put it in the budget but one thing that we wasn't able to predict is what the solar was going to produce so we put a $25,000 marker in there and the solar is actually it's in the neighborhood of 130 something thousand dollars so the overage is is what we produced in solar and then what amp did not Seventy-four thousand dollars that they didn't budget. So that's the overage. Now we've got a good year for solar, so we know what to project for next year. Because, like Patty said, Amp sent us a thing. It's the hottest uh, summer on record. So we know where the sunshine is. We know how much electric we're going to predict, and we've got the most up-to-date information from Amp. All the hydros are online, so they they had a good year of running. So we should be pretty close this year um, just because I'm I think I'm being a little thick so um, now you have a year of experience with solar so you correct. know how much solar energy we're able to generate correct I see so that we didn't know that before we did not have no information mm -hmm. prior to that uh, to be able to put numbers to paper okay so Myself and the last financial director, we always knew that we was coming back at the end of the year because we did not want to say it was 400000 We didn't want to say it was 50000 So we put a $25,000 marker in there. For the solar. For the solar by itself. For the solar. But the majority is related to AMP. Yeah. Half of it. <clears throat> half of it is AMP. Half of it is our solar. But they corrected it now that all the hydros are online. That was without the last hydro being online. So we should have good numbers from them as well. So, I mean, it, I don't feel like, I mean, there's nothing we can do about this, right? So for me, I guess I'm thinking more about the future and the budget and mm -hmm. I guess it's a big surprise, right? 200K is a big supplemental appropriation. So, and I totally understand it, how if, we got here, but we need to avoid this in the future. So if we take out the solar, which what is what Colleen and I and Patty have done, mm -hmm. we've taken out the solar, we've got it pretty, pretty close. So we also used more, we also had a larger demand this year than what we had last year with, I think our demand was 7.9 and our demand this year is 10 point something. So we've got a larger demand going on right now too. So we try to keep it as close. I will say that 200 was, but we had a problem on both ends. We didn't know what our solar was gonna produce and we didn't realize what the last hydro was gonna do when they come online. Johnny, I have a question. Yes, well, ma'am. Um, so uh, did we also have increased revenues, electric revenues? I mean, Correct. I assume we did. Right, absolutely. So it's not just we use more than what we did uh, the year before. That's correct. We don't have those official numbers, but when we have uh, 
point or three meg jump on the demand we've right. got increased so i mean so i think this is not going to hold us up from approving this supplemental <laughs> but i would like some clarity about the solar issue because I, I mean i feel like i understand it pretty well but i don't think this is that clear so if we could just kind of put on paper sort of how it works and I guess in particular what Marianne mentioned about both the expense and revenue piece and how it you know contributes to our overall energy use and how about if we look at that when we're doing the enterprise funds in 2019 okay like yes okay well we must have had some numbers from the people who put the solar uh, array in of what they expected we would get we correct? Did not. They gave us nothing. They, they gave us they gave us what they thought it would do. Yeah, that's but they true. can't tell us how many hot days, how many cold days, how many cloudy days. So they just said this is what it will produce on a good day. And how do you how many good days do you know that we're going to have? We don't know that. And so we had to have a year under. But, but I under, I'm understanding that um, I mean when people use more electricity. It's not like the village is going into debt two hundred thousand dollars. No. This, I mean, that's the way it kind of can sound right. to people. Because that's yeah. why I think it needs to be explained. Not right. that it needs to be explained so the public understand. This means that more energy, more electric was used. Correct. People paid higher bills as a result. Uh, and, and we didn't budget for none of that. And it wasn't in the budget, but it's correct. not coming out of the general fund or something no, like that. Correct. So if we so could just kind of do like a, you know, a brief review on, you know. We've got our solar array. Mm -hmm. Here are some like outcomes, results, and, and, and yeah, we can do that. And then in February we can come back when uh, AMP brings us all the 100% data and tells us exactly everything that we use for the 2018 season. But, well. but okay. that's a huge increase of use by our community Correct. from seven something to ten. That was just in a one day. 7 megawatts to 10 megawatts on peak demand. So that was a large, and it was uh, between 4 and 5 p.m. Right. I want to say it was in August, uh, actually. It was one of the, actually, I think it, it was, was one of the hottest, July days. One of the July days between 4 and 5. Okay. So a lot of people had their AC on, cooking, taking baths and showers, and the electric use was up there. Which is why we keep sending out those peak shaving things. Okay, well, good. So let's follow up on this. Uh, and with that, um, uh, actually, let's go ahead and do a vote, even though we'll be doing a second reading, I guess. Sure. Hempflin. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Ouch. Yes. Okay. So we are now uh, at citizen concerns. This is the time on the agenda where we take any comments about things that are not on the agenda. I saw that Marsha Walgren signed up. So Marsha, we'll have it you come up. It is on the agenda. What's that? It is on the agenda. Huh. Is it? It'll be at the end. Yes, I realize okay. that's on the agenda. Um, I just wanted to say that um, this week I wrote a letter informing council that U.S. EPA's decision about the Vernet contamination and their cleanup plan. And the U.S. EPA has come out strongly on the side of the citizens and rejected the plan as it was, added 11 pages of requirements, and um, it's very hopeful that we're going to get a comprehensive cleanup. And I also encourage village government to obtain um, experts and to have a seat at the table. And then I was very happy to see in the packet that there will be during the Environmental Commission's report that there's you're presenting a letter intending to convey support for meaningful and comprehensive cleanup and I just wanted to thank you very much for that I also um, talked to Judith and my letter didn't make the packet I guess it got on the table but it didn't make the packet and Judith said it could appear next yeah, my week. Judy can. Yes, it, I didn't Judy. Talk to you. Okay. I'm sorry. Judy next. said it could appear in the packet next week. However, my attachments with it would take council's approval, uh -huh. and um, I would I would like to ask for approval to have my attachments in there. If it's too much paper, uh, it's perfectly fine if it's on the website. But a uh, special concern to me is the areas, uh, the three diagrams that show where the worst contamination is in the plume 
um, and also how it goes into the stream because I think it's very important that people in town are informed as to what's happening. We do put, and we also have a report that our expert made um, criticizing the plan, but we also, I think it's important people can read the plan itself that the EPA, the US EPA has provided. So if, um, if you could put that in the packet or online, I think it'd be very good because uh, we will have it in the library, but it takes time for the library to get it in. Yeah. It has to go to Xenia and, and... And we can do that. Yeah, thank that's, you. Not, that's not a problem. All right. Well, thank you. So. And thank you very much for coming out in support of a comprehensive cleanup. Yep. Absolutely. Thanks, thank Marcia. You. Thank you. And, and I do want to clarify, although, you know, we do have Environmental Commission, you know, in our updates, we, do, we don't technically have this issue on our agenda. That's so what I, I saw. That's right. what I came up with yep. at, at this point. So thanks for following up. Um, any other citizen concerns? Yes. Come on up, Karen. <laughs> Karen Wintrow. Um, I want to thank, um, on behalf of Alex Scott, um, the street fair event coordinator, myself and the board, um, I want to thank the village staff and um, everybody involved, PD involved with street fair this Saturday and all the work that was done leading up to it. Everything I've heard so far from merchants, from vendors, from people that attended has been very positive. The weather was perfect. Um, and I think ev almost all the vestiges of street fair are gone now. I think the banners may be down. So it was quick work um, getting everything set up. And by 7 o'clock on Saturday, you hardly know that it ever happened. So um, thanks to everybody. Thanks to the community. I know it's always. Um, a bit of an intrusion into the neighborhoods and parking can be a challenge and getting to Tom's can be a challenge, but um, it really is a very important day for our merchants, a very important day for our nonprofits who raise a lot of money um, and a very important day for vendors who have the opportunity to come and um, sell their wares um, at Street Fair. So thank you all for supporting it and supporting all the other events uh, that Yellow Springs does. And if nobody's mentioned Porch Fest, I do want to say that Porch Fest was incredible also. Um, a great event from the, um, the from Arts and Culture Commission and um, certainly hope that one will continue. Thanks, Thanks Karen. Yeah, Porch Fest was awesome. Um, I also want to say uh, the village appreciated having uh, a booth right there at, in the information circle to uh, highlight the active transportation plan. Uh, you may have noticed a couple of the renderings are outside on the table. And, um, uh, you know, again, I mentioned that we'll have the final uh, active transportation plan next month. So thanks a lot. Any other citizen concerns? All right. Oh, yes, Athena. Uh, hi, Athena Fannin, uh, Minerva Barker. Um, I'm going to, I know you guys can't respond to this, but I just really want it on the public record. I'm going to request some information from your tasers later. I've been told that your officers can delete them, um, a specifically a sergeant, if they choose to. I can't, I can't, haven't gotten a hold of the policy yet, but. I do want that taser information. It's from this weekend, which I have not yet got confirmed that someone was tased. That's all. Okay. Thanks. Okay. If there are no other citizen concerns, we're going to move into special reports. And um, first of all, I believe Cheryl, you're going to present to us about the Wheeling Gaunt exciting project. Hi, everyone. How are you this evening? Hi. Hey, good. Hi. Welcome. Hello. Um, my name is Cheryl Durgens. Um, I am a project manager for the Willingaunt Sculpture Project Committee. And um, I'm presenting about um, a location proposal that we submitted to the Village Arts Commission. And this is uh, kind of the next steps in, in the phase of things. Um, just giving a little background about Willingaunt. Um, Willingaunt was born between 1812 and 1816 in Carrollton, Kentucky. Um, he purchased his freedom for $900 and moved to Yellow Springs in the 1860s, where he began buying property in Yellow Springs in 1864. So Willingaunt is a person that people know by name, kind of, sort of, but they don't really know why they know him, so to speak. 
in contemporary times. Um, project background. So the Willing Gaunt Sculpture Project, it really began as a kitchen table discussion about Willing Gaunt and his legacy with a group of Yellow Springs residents, including people who now live in his home and property that he once owned. So the official meetings began in the fall of 2017, and the um, anticipated project conclusion date is somewhere around June 20, I should not say 2010, it should say 2020. Um, the idea of honoring his legacy with the sculpture was presented to the Yellow Springs Arts Council, and then, um, who then took on development of the project. Um, Yellow Springs uh, mm -hmm. resident and renowned sculptor Brian Mon, who actually lives in one of Willingott's former properties, um, has been contracted by the Yellow Springs Arts Council to create the sculpture. And he's currently working on ma maquettes for the sculpture itself. Can I also mention that Brian's sculptures are the three that are at the hotel? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, which <laughs> are amazing. So the Willingaunt Sculpture Project Committee is comprised of Yellow Springs residents and individuals with an interest in the life and legacy of Willingaunt. So local resident Dr. John Fleming, the first director of, the, of both the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center, and the director emeritus of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, and historian Dr. Kevin Magruder, Antioch professor and director of the Blacks and Yellow Springs Tours, uh, created by Project 365 or notable members. I would like to say we have really a really great committee um, in terms of um, partnerships. And in addition to individual members, we have organizations who uh, represent individuals but also communities that are not just in Yellow Springs. Uh, part of Yellow Springs is the James A. McKee Association, Project 365, Antioch College, the Yellow Springs Historical Society, um, Wilberforce University in particular because Gaunt actually, Willing Gaunt actually left or bequeathed his properties that he once lived in and owned for the most part except for the um, land that we call Gaunt Park to Wilberforce University when he passed away. We also have the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center uh, as part of uh, the partnering organizations and this committee meets once a month. Special partnerships. The Yellow Springs Community Foundation uh, serves a dual capacity as a funding administrator for donations and outside grants and is also a project funder. Central State University's uh, WCSU FM 88.9, uh, we're in, uh, probably gonna do some podcast series with them in the partnership. Um, we have a letter of commitment from them. And then also former resident, Yellow Springs resident and professor emeritus in Portland, Oregon, uh, Brenda Hubbard, who is six to nine months from completing a book about the life and legacy of Will and Gaunt. And then also the Yellow Springs School District. Now the capacity in which the Yellow Springs School District is, uh, in addition um, to the sculpture, uh, we're planning a mural and a children's book that has already actually been created by uh, Mikasa Sims' first grade class via project-based learning modules. And what they did was they created an A to Z um, ABC book uh, hmm. about the life of Will and Gaunt. Um, it's actually super cute. And um, we're, we're setting up programming related to historical documentation, uh, tourism opportunities, and educational uh, uh, educational technology as part of the various plan uh, in excuse me technology are in various planning and execution stages so sculpture location and next steps one finalize the sculpture location which is what we're hopefully working on now uh, we have notified the village arts commission of a location a proposed location and we talked about that over a couple of meetings. Uh, we're gonna determine the next steps to finalize the location agreement, which is part of the reason why we're here this evening. And also, um, further down the line, solidifying a, a mural location once the sculpture location is finalized. And then this is the proposed location. Hilderon Park at the mouth of Yellow Springs, um, uh, 68. And so, 
we feel like this is a, a really good location for a couple reasons. Um, the corridor views for both walking and, and uh, riding. Um, it's approximate location to other cultural points of interest and also over time other attractions and art can be kind of built around that whatever uh, is proposed by uh, down the line by the village council and people of the village. Um, it's, a ten, it's, it's a 10 to 15 uh, minute walk from Mills Lawn, the Antioch School, and the Children's Center. Um, and it's also 15 minutes from Wilberforce University. Uh, so it's really an ideal location um, for both walking and historical tours. So that's pretty much it. Are there any questions? I, I want to jump in here and, and add a little bit. Thank you, Cheryl, for coming this evening. And Art and Culture Commission was so excited when you came and spoke to us. Uh, both about the statue and also about the mural, which we're really not getting into tonight because that's likely going to go on, not on village property, right. but the total project <laughs> idea is just so exciting. And um, so after Cheryl uh, came and spoke with us, I got in touch with Patty, uh, who got in touch with Johnny, and later in the packet you'll see there's a little mock-up <laughs> of um, Hilda Ron Park about where this um, statue might potentially go and based on conversations with you know the village manager Patty and with Johnny there does not seem to be any obstacle unless the council has some concern with moving forward to um, planning the placement of the statue at this location so I really wanted the council to hear about this to know about this intention um, I mean there's some details like for example um, uh, Johnny brought up this really important idea about like when you mow around the statue and weed whack around the statue you don't want there to be any damage so it would have to be on a pedestal of a certain right. size and this is kind of this collaboration between artists and maintenance of the park so um, we just wanted to get in front of you really early to be certain that there weren't any barriers that council saw or that the community saw for placing this really important statue at, at I think what you describe as really well, the sort of gateway or mouth of Yellow Springs. Mm -hmm. So, so um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for doing this, oh, and being part you. of this, and for making the presentation. And just so for the next step, <coughs> will you want, after you've done some more research, will you be coming back to council? with the request to have this be the site. Well, I think this is the request to have it placed there. Mm -hmm. um, from conversation with Patty, it's not clear that we need to actually vote on it, ha on this location, but just to be more aware that it's going to be there. Okay. So but I'm going to ask that we put it on the agenda for our next meeting to have further discussion about place if there are any concerns well, and I want to point out that that's not no, that's, that's not the mock-up the, right. the mock-ups at the end of our packet right yeah. I think uh, I, I think it's a really good idea to have a resolution because it is public property but also because it's such a cool project mm -hmm. like I want to show our commitment and you know I did want to add although we weren't listed as a partner that you know with that we feel like we you know through the Arts and Culture Commission are at the table and part of the coalition. Um, two things that I would like us to consider. Um, one is, uh, and, and I don't want this to hold up the project, but if we have time is we could potentially create a trailhead in this area. And so we could think a little bit more, you know, and it's related to the maintenance piece, but also just kind of, I mean, because this is on, you know, the Little Miami Scenic Trail, um, I mean, we could think about doing something more. And it doesn't all have to, have to happen in the first phase, but a plan like that might make sense. And there's, there's definitely uh, county and other funding to support that. Um, and then the second thing is I do want to make sure we stay in touch about the mural because 
For a long time, I've been thinking about a project I saw in Cleveland where they made it a community effort. Yes. So it was artist-led, yes. but you know, the youth and others like got involved, and and you know, we'd love to. And actually, I can I speak to a little to yeah. that a little bit. Um, my background is um, I was a project manager for the City of Philadelphia Mural Arts Program before I moved back to um, Yellow Springs, and that's exactly what we did. So I, the idea of bringing in the community, uh, having it a community-led effort, and there are so many ways, like um, at least in Philadelphia, we didn't actually paint directly on walls. We painted on a, uh, a kind of cloth, what we call parachute cloth, which made it easier to carry it around, grid things out so that you could go to a senior center and have them um, paint on a wall. You could go to a, a school and have them paint. And so everyone gets a piece of mm. this mural. So it's right up, that's exactly what we're headed for with the mural. So that's great that you mentioned that. Cool. It, it's so exciting what your knowledge and what you bring to the community in terms of, of mural art and this project. So, you know, time permitting on agenda, I would love to have you come back and tell the rest of the story. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Yes. Okay. Judith? Um, I'm not quite, I guess, um, is this the corner you're going around? Because uh, my only concern about it is it's a little bit away from the action activity of the community. And I, I'm assuming there's going to be some effort to, you know, that at night and so on, that it's mm -hmm. not kind of isolated. Uh, that it's really in the center of activity in the community. So that's my only concern, yeah. and I would guess you guys have talked about that already. Well, the Art and Culture Commission did not have a role in selecting this location. Okay. This location was brought to us by the committee that's working on the Gaunt Sculpture and Mural Project. Mm -hmm. But the proposed location is village property. So this was, I, and they had an exhaustive process to select this location. So mm, my role and our role was more to just make sure that it was okay with the village. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, uh, Judy, if you can jump to that last visual, it's a little bit better angle to mm -hmm. see. Although I will say when Flock of Hands was there, it was very prominent. Right. And so as long as we think about it, you know, in that kind of way, and I know, you know, Karen's in the mix as well, um, it could become, it, it mm -hmm. should be very prominent. Yeah, I would agree. Um, we, we thought about it because of flock of hands, honestly, and also the idea that um, one of the things I can do if, if, I, if I am invited back is to kind of talk a little bit about corridor development because a lot of uh, people would be amazed at the kind of art that's placed next to each other in different areas and communities. And so the idea is kind of to build on that if the village and the Arts Commission is so inclined to be able to add different things to that location as well over time. Uh, with Will and Gaunt's legacy and who he was, the idea of him kind of welcoming people into the community was the consideration. Cool. Judy, I think it's like the last thing, last thing in the pack. It's no, actually I think it's in before. Front. Oh, is it in front? Oh. It's before this presentation. Well, there you go. There you go. There it is. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think, uh, this is awesome. Karen, uh, you want to say something Karen quickly? Wants to say something. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Cheryl. All right, thanks, Cheryl. Yeah, thank you. Um, Karen Wintrow, um, I absolutely support this. It's, the location is a little different than I expected. I think I know that space and how it's used probably more than anybody, yeah. where the activity is, where people hang out. Um, a few months ago when, when you had the, the uh, infrastructure uh, meeting and presented infrastructure. There was some conversation about um, wanting to do some improvements to the train station. The chamber has taken on the landscape landscape maintenance. We've also taken on the project of re replacing and, and adding new bricks to that front um, brick area in front of the station. Brian mentioned the trailhead idea. We need more signage there. So I really hope that we look holistically at this space. I mean, this is an important statue, and I mean, I, I feel like it's going to end up being the most important piece there. Um, but that station is also pretty important, too. So I think it's, I, I, again, I hope, you know, maybe this can be a year or 2020 when this, when the sculpture is installed that 
we really take a look at how that whole space is used, do some major improvements to the station and, and the exterior. As Brian said, start to look for some outside funding from, from various sources. Right. Um, but, but again, the Chamber considers ourselves a partner in this. It's our office. Um, we, um, we've been promoting this, this project and um, certainly um, the whole historical piece. Um, so we want to be involved. All right. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I think this is the ideal kind of project, for example, to leverage the lodging tax. I mean, if we think about community development, I mean, this is amazing. Thank you, Cheryl. This is awesome. I think what you're hearing is definite support, and I like Marianne's idea that we formalize it in a resolution. So, okay, excellent. Um, all right, Colleen. Colleen, I think this is your show from, uh, for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, so we're going to talk about third quarter financials and then get into uh, a general fund presentation. Uh, and I just, I just want to note, we had allotted 30 minutes for the general fund. Right, and five minutes for the supplement and, or the and quarterly. Yeah. I expect, unless there's some way that we can keep adding question, putting questions on what they call the, the parking lot, it's going to take more than 30 minutes. I, I'm just saying that for all of us. So. I'll try to okay. inter right. interact with that. And time. FYI, we are exactly on schedule with our agenda so far. So it wasn't to hurry you up. I'm more no. speaking to You're us. Fine. You're <laughs> fine. And without my computer, I might not have answers to a lot. I have note paper, so I will be able to research tomorrow morning and get more answers back that I don't already have prepared. So first, um, since we talked about where we were, at our last meeting, we thought we would make that um, approved in the minutes as our quarterly finance report, if that is okay with council. Mm -hmm. yep. so, so if you want to make a motion to approve the third quarter financials, that will go in the minutes and satisfy the auditor. Okay. So this is not in this packet, but what was in the last packet, correct? Correct. That was a... a earlier meeting than the normal but it had everything but two days worth of right. revenue and expenses so that would qualify okay. if that's well okay. i'll make a motion to approve the uh third quarterly report second all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. okay okay and let's get right on our budget general fund i think we have some slides i just had a little overview um this is, um, I'm, of course, your new finance director, and, and most budgets are all uh, regulated by state, so we're going to do them all the same. However, I'm not sure how to present it, so I, I welcome questions as we go. I'm going to address all the needs of the, the village first in the budget. And the needs departmentalizes personnel, operating, expenditures, contractual services, materials and supplies, capital, miscellaneous, and debt. Mainly in the capital, we're going to be looking at a lot of the infrastructure that coincides with the report that um, the service, the public works director and his staff had put on so we can try to move forward on some of those needed repairs. So going into um, the pie chart, or we'll go into the, to the main part. No, let's do the pie chart. Do the pie chart? Okay. All right. The first page. Of the pie chart <laughs> is an overview of um, what we're going to talk about today, the general fund. And the general fund's portion of the budget equals 31%, and that is at $4,162,875. Special revenues, funds, the capital, and the enterprise are all going to be coming up at a different meeting. So I'm going to turn the page and look at our general fund revenues. I, I have a question. You have a different one up. Go ahead. I do. Yes. Um, the first pie Maybe. chart you just discussed. Mm -hmm. Where yes. do the special revenue funds come from? Special revenue. Is that? I'm going to turn to my budget. Actually, it's not on my copies tonight. It's it's like so, permissive motor vehicle tax, gasoline tax. I'll have it in my uh, uh, finance yeah, report. Tax. Okay. 
But it, does it go into the general fund? No. Special revenues are, are separate funds. So it's a special source of revenue. Correct. Not coming into the general fund, and it goes toward special things. And it has its own specific expenditures, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, as we're kind of getting into this presentation, I did want to say something. Um, because I think it can be confusing from any citizen that read the 181 page packet uh, that uh, Colleen mentioned wants and needs. I assume that wants and needs are embodied in these documents. I don't see all of these as needs, but if they are being proposed as needs, I do want to emphasize that this is the first time council is seeing this. So we have not committed to the uh, all of the, I guess, requests that are being mentioned on this budget. So I guess I want to, you know, because as I got to Patty's manager report and it talked about some of the, uh, you know, uh, funding gaps that we will have in the future, I do want to keep in, or I guess let the public know, council has not yet said we're signing off on this proposed budget. Okay. So we're going to talk about it tonight and then get some feedback and see what, uh, what the council's pleasure is. Okay. Going back to the pie chart on the revenues for the general fund, this is listed as the revenue source for the general fund that we're talking about tonight. Real estate taxes, $887,250 is anticipated as revenue for next year. And the real estate taxes make up 26% of our general fund income. Kilowatt taxes is proposed at about $150,000 for revenue next year, and that is about 4%. Is it a different page, Marianne? Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it's the second pie chart page. Oh, no. just the, the revenues, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. You're fine. Um, income tax, $1,900,000 is our proposed amount that we should be getting in next year. And I'm looking at my percentage. That is 55% of the general fund for our revenue source. State shared taxes, I'm sorry, lodging tax, uh, put in for about 40,000 for next year. And the uh, lodging tax is about 1% of the general fund. State shared taxes, $237,415, that represents seven 7% of the general fund's income. Fines and permits are $21,850 estimated coming in, and that would be 1%. Miscellaneous receipts, $195,200, and that's 6%. So the majority of the general fund's income, again, is our income tax at 55% and real estate taxes at 26%. So I have, I have a question. and. Some of these questions maybe we'll just need to deflect. How was or was anticipated income from Cresco figured into the income? I have we, nothing on Cresco. The revenue point. sharing? The revenue. Uh, well, well it, it won't happen for another year. No, I mean so income tax for oh. people who work there. And, oh, um, yeah. well, right. I, I don't know that it was estimated, to be honest, but right now they, they only have a minimum number of employees, like 26 or something total, I think. Um, and, and it will be that for a while. Okay, so. But we should probably yeah. expect an uptick next year. So, so this would be conservative, hopefully. Okay. And it could be a, a balance with somebody that's maybe not producing income or at a retirement age. So it's, it's a little hard, unless you have a big volume to put into the budget, but we we certainly look at that for next year. Any other questions on the revenue pie? So we're going into the general fund expenditures, and I'm just starting at the top. Estimate council at $350,550. That's 8% of the expenditures of the general fund. Mayor's budget is 83500 represents 2%. Administration, $461,500. Administration is 11%. Operations, 
Auditor fees at thirty thousand. It's one percent of the budget. Rental property is fifty-seven thousand seven hundred at one percent. Library's budget is seven thousand five hundred. Didn't even make the chart, so it's less than one percent. Cables thirty-two thousand, about one percent of the general fund expenditures. Council commissions at twenty-five thousand. That is one percent. Public safety one million six hundred and fifty thousand. That represents 40% of the general fund. Planning is at 158,000. That represents 4%. Mediation is 9,125, which didn't make the chart, so it's less than 1%. Transfers, and those, these are transfers from the general fund's income to the other, and you'll see it in the budget. You're familiar with um, supporting your streets and parks mm -hmm. and some um, capital expenditure accounts. It's one million two hundred ninety-eight thousand. That represents thirty-one percent of the general fund. So the total is four million one hundred sixty-two thousand eight hundred seventy-five. Any questions on that page? It gets broken down as we get farther and farther into the budget. The rest of the pie, um, the enterprise, we'll talk about at the next um, meeting. So I had one more general fund uh, pie chart that I included at the last minute. It's a separate paper that was on your counter. It includes the transfers. So the amount of the transfers from the general fund, 12% goes to your street fund, 13% goes to your parks. Other than that, it's pretty much 1% Parks and Recs Improvement Fund, 1% to your Economic Development Fund. That's new for this year. Pension for the police is 2%. Facilities Improvement is 1%. Green Space is 1%. And Capital Equipment is less than 1%. So I was asked to break down the percentage of the transfers. Any questions on that page? So is this where we talked about, or, or for future budgets, if we had a, a fund for housing? Affordable housing, yeah. Right. So right. It, would, it would be one of these lines that doesn't exist right now. Right. Right. Should, should we talk about that now? Um, say, well, what do you think, Colleen? Are you ready for us to start? Giving you some uh, thoughts I, that we have, or do we want to finish why, why my, my proposal? Yeah, let's finish. Okay, and then yeah. then we'll see. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, but you know, with the with the caveat that I think we've all looked at this very carefully. I mean, I, I know I was kind of dreaming about it, so, <laughs> so we, we don't need to, uh, and not in, a, not in a positive way, so we don't need to read all the numbers, but um, okay, any highlights you want to make, but. Yeah, I, I guess personally, I would like to spend the majority of our 30 minutes on directing it towards what we're thinking. So anyway. Okay, well, and, and then with that being said, I'm just gonna go through and let you ask me any questions in each of the okay. departments. Okay, that's good. Um, do we wanna talk about the revenue first? Or is it pretty, pretty cut and dry on that? Any questions on the, the revenue? Yeah, I mean, you know, I know, I know we're going to realize more revenue for the lodging tax this year, but that's reflected in next year. Um, and I put in 40000 for 2019. Right. With a transfer going to the economic development of all but 3% for administrative fees. So hmm. there's about 38000 going over. And that's just from verbiage that I was hearing about wanting to take some of that money and use it for economic development. I don't, I don't think that there has been agreement on that. There hasn't been, what? but, but I think, yeah. I, yeah, I think Colleen was just maybe kind of showing like, so, we had indicated that we wanted to, you know, designate funds for certain things, but you're right, we have not agreed on that, so. And, and none of this, this is just our talk, our discussion. Mm -hmm. So any other questions on revenue? It's, sure. Are, is this the budget session, are you guys going to have other special meetings? I sure hope you so. Bet. Time that, that, 
Yeah. No. Citizens are supposed to be interactive in trying to understand the budget. We are going to have budget sessions for the rest of the year. What we're trying to figure out tonight is shaping this up so that we focus it. So, so we're approaching it a little bit differently in that um, I think councils already indicated some things that we want to be looking at, you know, certain special funds and whatnot. So um, I think there may be an opportunity for some comments today, but I know, for example, Mary Ann's brought up and I support par participatory budgeting. So I think we're going to explore that tonight and, uh, and, and, and sort of figure out how we're going to mold this discussion. Um, but there's going to be four more meetings talking about this for sure. And okay. I could also imagine that we might need a special work session. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Okay. We'll okay. Okay. Then we'll go on into the appropriations. Um, for the expenditure part, first one is council. Is there council's budget? I have uh, proposed three hundred fifty thousand five hundred fifty dollars for the two thousand nineteen. That starts on and your page might be different. Account one zero zero one, the department one zero zero one for council. Is everybody on the same page? Okay. Yeah. Wasn't a lot of. Um, There wasn't really a lot of changes from what I'm seeing as your history, but if there's any questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the professional services, is that, was there a basis for that or is that just basically carrying it over from? That one was pretty much carried over from your last year. 45000 was budgeted and we're well right on track in that department. Mm -hmm. So I use that same figure. Okay. The other, well, not exactly a question, but. What I did is when I went through this, I looked at the legal services. Mm -hmm. And I'm not clear if all the legal services are for Chris and his company or not. But when I added them all up, it came to $205,000. So um, what I would like, not at this meeting, but what I would like is have that bro broken down into what that, how, how that broke down. because. I see it's for council, it's for mayor, it's for the police, and for planning. And I'd like it, I mean, we could work offline on that. Right. I'm happy to. And actually, we are working on that, so I think this is a great time to bring that up. Um, yeah, even with our retainer structure, we have started to realize that, um, uh, that legal service expenses are increasing. And we want to uh, zone in on what it is that we need to control that better. Um, so I anticipate that this is going to be an area of the budget that we need to reduce. And part of that is as a way to you know, let council and the village know that we need to monitor those expenses better. So, um, so that is an amount that is, is too high right now. Um, and, and needs to be worked on. So, um, so there's been uh, some work on that, and uh, there'll be more discussion on that. Um, yeah, can, I also, can I say something on yeah, that? Yeah, please go ahead. I just want to point out, 2015, unless we're accounting for it differently, legal services were 87,000. In 2019, we're projecting 171,000. That's a no. total. It's 80 for legal. In 2019, 2018 is 80. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I dropped down. Yeah. yeah. We went Easy. from, I'm sorry, from 27,000. That can't be right. Well, but, but what is true, Judith, and, and we'll, we are. I mean, I'm remembering in around 2014, 2013, there was a decision made. Yep. And so 2015, two, we did very well with our legal services, partly because we, we uh, stuck very closely to the retainer, and we didn't have a lot of, I guess, uh, additional things mm -hmm. that popped up. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so we have some analysis about that, and, okay. uh, and, and so that'll be something that we'll look at. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I also want to say, so this, this is an area where um, I, I do think that we need to look at uh, reducing 
the budget. Um, so I noticed that we've budgeted 30000 for the village manager search. I, I assume that's what that 30000 yes. is. Um, and we will not be spending that much. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't know if other council members feel differently. Um, Where is that? It's, it's, gonna it's be... added under recruitment and testing. And it's in the it's just in the 2019 oh, line. I see. Um, but I don't and I don't feel comfortable like budgeting that much because I do think part of our budgeting exercise is making us sort of restrict the kind of spending that we do. So I don't know what that amount is yet, but but I think you know that was one that I flagged. Let me yes. Add on to that though. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether included was a, a double? A time when Patty would be working for a month and the new village manager would be working for a month? When I went to research the cost, the, the expenditures that you had at your last search, um, the management company came in at over $20,000. Mm -hmm. And then there was travel expenditures. Um, so this is about probably 10% higher than what you had as your actual search cost in 14. Mm -hmm. But did you budget for the month that, because there's that one month planned where I'm working with the new village manager to transition? If it was paid out of salaries, it wouldn't have been in this number. No, did you, it, it, was, it didn't happen with me. Oh, you mean for, yes. for our salary for yes. next? No, I did not. That's good. So that, that would be an addition, even if we're not paying right. as much for... And you guys actually mentioned that maybe that would be more like two weeks, but well, well, six we weeks, we four. four to six yeah. weeks is what we're looking at. We were hmm. looking at All right. Well, no. so we need to think about those numbers when we make these decisions. Um, so as Judith mentioned, uh, you know, I think we definitely need to look at legal services. We've got 70,000 budget budgeted. That seems high to me. And then um, also our training budget went up quite a bit, and I wasn't sure about that. Um, Your training budget is 7,800. Um, the budget was 7,851 for right. 18. Right. So that went up like 4,000. From 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and not not that I don't think it, training is important, but again, um, that that seems out of line with what we've been spending. So. I will just say that I kind of hope that we would reduce this budget item to 320, so get us back in line with this year, as opposed to 350. So, and I have some notes about that, but you know, again, I think for now this is just kind of a general discussion. But I do think this is a budget, I, a, a budget line that. Um, we need to control our expenditures on. And I do think council's been good about that in the past. Um, but I, I'd like a budget that signals to us that um, if we are starting to exceed, that we're talking about why we're exceeding. All right? I, I think not to get too off track, but you know, if we're talking about um, the fact that planning and zoning is blowing up, that's a good thing in my mind. Um, so I think there are reasons why you know we might exceed our estimates, but uh, I think this is one where uh, we need to clamp down a bit. So. I made a note. Three twenty. We can get there. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? I know you like my uh, numbers that I throw out there. <laughs> I so. Do. We'll see, we can get those done. <laughs> The mayor's budget is next. Is there any questions on the mayor's budget? It's actually um, the only um, bigger expense that's in there was adding the a prosecutor. Okay. Which and we have not decided we're doing, right? Just, so we're just putting that in there in case we do. Well, I'm not, I can't see that I will vote for that. I mean, I don't know what other people will do, but my understanding is that it, it, if it happened, I wouldn't see it happening next year. Mm -hmm. That's my vote. I, yeah, and I think we, you know, we'll have to talk about it more. I kind of like having it in there in case we realize that this is something that makes sense. And I know we've gotten lots of indicators about 
um, you know, some of the things that maybe are out of compliance. But that being said, I agree with you. I, I think it may take a year for us to get there. So I, I think that's reasonable to. And then I, I would suggest we knock it in half and say 15,000. Mm -hmm. We're definitely not going to be doing it by the beginning of the year. So. The only other thing I wanted to say, and I don't know that this is directly, directly related for you, Colleen, but um, I do want to make sure that we're really thinking about our fees for both planning and zoning and for mayor's court and making sure that they really do meet our expenses. Mm -hmm. And this kind of just ties to this whole that um, I want our revenue generation to take care of the things that we're doing as much as possible. Yeah, and, and if I could just very quickly speak to that as well as um, one other thing. And when we were preparing this budget, staff started talking about how we could better and more efficiently use what we have. And one thing that we talked about was the fees and how that needs to be revisited. And, and because our mayor's court fees are not at all in line with um, what you know, even surrounding other mayor's courts have. But the other thing I want to mention that, that staff is talking about across all departments are our alternative schedules that cut our overtime. Um, so that council knows that this is something we're looking at. We've talked about it at staff meetings and all of the supervisors across all of the departments are looking at this. Yeah. So. Well, I think it's good because overtime and part-time mm -hmm. expenses both are things I think we've got to really look at, you know, and yeah, thinking and about our yeah. staffing. And I, and I agree with that, um, although I, I'm also going to say that this past year has been a horrible, horrible anomaly for uh, trying to get things done with, with short staffs um, because of illnesses and, and people leaving and all that kind of thing. So, right. But, but, we're, still adding, yeah. but we're still adding 500000 to... Yeah the general fund, yeah. so, so it we're is, in good shape this year. Yeah, it is something that we're aware of. We, we realize we have to get it under control because, yeah, we may be adding, you know, 500000 to the general fund, but over time we're going to start kicking into our reserves again, and we don't want to do that, right. you know, um, so we want to be really careful about that. So the staff is looking at, at those things to try to do what we can in that regard. Would you see that impacting next year's budget, or do you think? I would assume sense? so, yes, but I can't tell you in what way because we're still looking at all the different so, alternatives. So, do you think it doesn't make sense to try and factor anything in? Not right now. Not right now. Okay. Okay. Administration. Any questions on administration? Uh, mm -hmm. This is probably the first one that you're going to see where the wages are up um, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm putting in for the liability of accruals for anybody that leaves, and we also know that Patty will be leaving, um, and we'll be having the new replacement, so I have some cushion on, on her exit. Um, I also reduced the part-time wages down, so it kind of counsels on a little bit of it, but overall, um, She's, like, she's reduced her professional services amounts. We came in at about 60000 more in the administrative department versus last year. That also includes a capital purchase. And, and you increased legal services a bit. And legal services are? From 48 yeah. five up to, to 60, 60. yes. Yep. So, I mean, that's a line that we need to really think about. Um, why are rents and leases four times more? I mean, I know this is not a, a huge line item, but I, I guess I don't understand the jump from I'll, 15. I'll do some detail reports on those. Okay. That one I wouldn't have. Um, okay. Because every department has rents and leases, and there's prorations on copiers and, and uh, um, software. And there's a, a lot. So that one I'll, I'll get some detail on. And could you comment on 53104 um, professional services? It looks like maybe 2019 projected is kind of an average, but it's one of those kind of up and down line items. 
Correct. And the professional services would be anybody outside. Again, there's multiple vendors in that line item. Our uh, tech advisors. Um, it's yeah. It's it's any it's any regular rent or lease. So it could be tech advisors. It could be something the copy part of the copier lease. I think one of the things we actually looked up in, on Johnny's budget were at the mats. What? Oh, that's rents and leases. She's yeah, I'm talking at professional about services. Oh, I'm sorry. Professional this services. Would be like John yeah, this would be like John Courtney. Uh, I'm trying to think of who. What okay. consultant did we hire last year? So 2018 was big, uh, and then was it broadband? Bowen. Okay. Broadband. Patrick Bowen. I don't know. Although that should have come out of right. council. That should have come out of council. Right. But I'll detail that one. Yeah. So um, it's yeah, it's yeah, professional contracts other than legal. I'm trying to think what else there is. Hmm. Moving on. Or well, yeah, I mean, I will just say, yeah. This, <laughs> you probably don't want to hear the number that I'd like to target for this uh, line item, but. Well, there's one more thing. Yes. Uh, the car. The car is, um, the manager was requesting a, a car, so it, that is in that budget. Yes, I if see that. Here, here's why, Marianne. We used to have a staff car, and um, the staff car got taken to become a meter reader car when, when one of the, when the meter reader had the accident. And so now the staff uses their own cars, and the staff includes myself, Denise, Ruth Ann, anybody that doesn't have a regular no, I, vehicle. I, I don't dispute staff having a car, but I noticed that the police department is also requesting a new car. Lisa and I have talked about digging into the police budget a bit, and I've gotten some information, but I want to do that. and. Um, if we end up getting a new police car, then it seems like maybe we could use a existing. I mean, there, there might be some other options mm -hmm. than just buying a new car. And I'll say any new cars I think we buy should be fuel efficient. Right. The one I put in for was a hybrid. Thank you. And I mean, so if uh, the staff car went to the meter reader, um, mm -hmm. I mean, shouldn't there be, should this expense be shared? Is it being shared? Well, the, I don't have a staff car now. We don't have one in admin. So what's happening to it because that person just left? We're, we're using our own vehicles to go places. And I, I know for myself, most of the time, I don't put in for the miles of each reimbursement because it's just. No, but I'm asking what happened to that car because it has that staff the, member. The Taurus? What are you doing with the Taurus? Right now, it's currently our meter car. I see. Uh, we, we've actually used. Uh, old retired police cruisers, and uh, one has now actually been wrecked, and so we're down to the meter car uh, for the tours. Mm -hmm. And yours was uh, the pickup truck, and it actually it the frame like rotted right out of it, right? So it was not safe to drive no more, so we had to sell it on go bills as well. Mm -hmm. The boat cars were retired, actually, the tours was from. Uh, police uh, No, the truck was. The truck was. The, yeah, the Taurus was a purchase as a staff car right before I got here. But. Okay. Well, I want to, I guess I'd like to make sure we're completely thinking about the sharing of the cost of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe this is a, an area that I would commit to digging in on with you guys yeah, because I I my department uses it Judy could use it the mayor and the clerk of court right. could use it I mean it's yeah it's, uh, it's, it's a staff yeah it's just right I, yeah I'm not happen. opposed to it I guess I'm thinking about where it comes from but the administrative budget line I think is one we need to work on so um, but anyway yeah I've got a lot of notes about that one so maybe I'll take that one on Okay, auditors. Um, it's not much change on that. Thirty thousand. It was thirty thousand six hundred last year. Brought that down a little bit. Rental property. Um, pottery shop. Wall repairs. Okay, we're kicking into some of the capital uh, repairs. Is in this budget if approved. 
26,000. That um, is what brought the rental budget up for, to 57,000 from 30,000 of last year. Mm -hmm. And the whole capital is going to be on another. Also, all of these numbers rental that are in capital. here are on a capital report. So you can look at and say, well, maybe we can't do this one this year. We want to do it next year. And maybe there's something on 2020 you prioritize for this year, and we can change them. I'm sorry, did you say that the pot shop was in, listed under the rental property? Yeah, Pottery this is. shop wall where, repairs. Where is that? Um, it's, well, it's not identified here, but in the capital projects, yeah. yeah, so that's about the, the back wall and the other recommended projects. I think you um, the account number. Oh, it's showing. under capital. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 26,000. Yeah. Right. So I think, I mean, we've talked about this on my desk. Right. But so we're spending twenty six thousand dollars, and what are we getting? A dollar a year. I mean, plus so the community benefit of housing, John Bryan Community Pottery. Um, yeah, th this is an area where you know I'm going to say in general um, that you know number one, if we are going to think about participatory budgeting, some of these items could go into that mix, mm -hmm. um, and I think. We need to tee that up for our next meeting. Um, I don't know that we can dive in that tonight. But I also think we need to start thinking about other funding. So whether that's um, organizations that are benefiting, thinking about capital campaigns that support this work. So maybe it's matching. Or you know, ultimately, do we have to think about other uses for these buildings that are revenue generating? Um, this is a significant amount of money. So, uh, so we need, I think let's figure out some ideas to that. Yes. I mean, um, Lisa, would you be willing to talk with me about that? About, uh, yeah. I mean, because uh, another so thing would be, I'd like to ensure that if we're spending 26000 mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people getting benefits out of it. Right, of right. Great. There's a, right. already been some, you know, earlier this year, Art and Culture Commission tried to kind of get under peek underneath the hood if you will of the pottery shop and understand the benefits to the community and try to quantify that we didn't get very far actually um in right. in that value proposition so i would be glad to work on that right. yeah i i imagine sorry patty that that work could involve two things one is you know as i looked at the budget i started to see things that if we are going to make a proposal for participatory budgeting you know, that maybe amounts to a couple hundred thousand of, of the budget that flagging items that could go into that mix. Mm -hmm. And this could be related to sidewalks and green space and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Even policing. And yeah, and policing as well, right? You know, things like the cruiser. Are you thinking of for this fiscal 2019? I don't know. But I, I mean, but, but I'm just saying, so that's, that's one thing to consider in that work. That's all I'm saying. But the other thing is, I do think we have to look at items where um, we could get other support. And you know, again, I mentioned capital campaigns, but also grant funding and other things um, to help make these things happen. Or they may need to be postponed. Well, I'm going to suggest that if we're going to consider participatory budgeting, which makes sense to consider, that we do that as part of our goal session mm -hmm. and not try and do it for 2019 I think that's okay well that's that's a possibility too is that we reserve that money out and you know do it later so we don't actually I mean we could like later on say we're not budgeting for these items right now but no I, we will what consider I mean them. is that we get a 2019 budget right. agreed upon and in our goals at the beginning of the year say for 2020 we are going to work on participatory budgeting and then spend some time looking at what are the kind of things we would do. I don't, I don't, I think it would be too crazy making to try mm -hmm. and pull things out of this budget and then try and do participatory budget is. Well, but just don't forget, we can add things later, right? You know, so, I mean, we do it all the time. I mean, we do, we have a supplement almost every meeting. So, um, so I don't know. I think we should just be careful about things we commit to. Um, at this point and I maybe this is a because the I did do the brief on the um, 
all of the different donations we make. And the, the John Bryan Community Powder Release and the other leases are noted in there. So um, it is later in your packet um, and not up with the budget materials, but that is in there for your information. No, I don't think I saw that. It's in the... It's okay. back by my report, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Did that include event in-kind money for events? Yep. No, it, it, I did not include in-kind for events. Okay. Well, I included... You about some of that? I did. Well, I did um, just basic, do, not the economic development event fees, but I did all of the <coughs> other Tecumseh Land Trust, homing, leases, all of those other. Oh. Mm -hmm. Antioch College, those are all in there. Okay, so I think we should spend five more minutes on this. And, you know, but again, we're setting things up for our next discussion. So, uh, why is it so expensive to paint a water tank? Oh, yeah. special it's, paint. It's, it is horribly expensive. That's, well, a, that's a Johnny question. <laughs> yeah, you want yeah. How, why is water it so expensive? Rehab. Half a million dollars to paint a water tank. It better look cool. Yeah, that's it's inside and out. Inside oh, inside. Yeah. <laughs> I just had to ask. Right. <laughs> well, we have to use a. Maybe I'm not the only one that wondered why it was five hundred thousand no, dollars. No, no, we. One million gallon tank. Well. It's just not one. It's actually two, and that's inside and out. Yeah, and and it's. It's special paint. It's multiple layers of special paint. It's sandblasting. It's all those things. I see. Well, hopefully the outside can be a public art project. Um, it actually can be, and I have experience in that, actually. All right, we did. probably. Why, why, I have a question, Johnny. Why does it have to be painted? What happens if it doesn't get painted? We're, we are budgeting right now, saying that it does, but until the divers actually dive into tanks and actually look at the inside of the tank, we can't tell you that the inside needs done. What happens is if it breaks down, then it starts contaminating the water that's inside yes, the tank. Yes. So inside is the most important to make, keep maintained and keep everything going. The outside, they can fade and they can look bad, but when you're doing the inside, you also want to do the outside. So what if we had never painted the inside? What would happen? You, you wouldn't be able to drink at it because the water, it would be rust. Okay. So, so it's like stainless or rust. Rusts. Correct. Okay. But it not be potable water anymore if you just let it. Okay. So it needs to be painted inside for safety for so it doesn't rust. Outside is less of a concern except aesthetics. Except for if it starts rusting on the outside. Right. And you start you need to maintain it as, and it's not been painted for a long time. Yeah, you, know, you only we have cleaned them on the inside. We had divers in there. Two years ago, we they were in last year too. Yeah. We had them on one last year and one year. Yeah, it, so, and it only has to be done every so many years. It's not like a. It's like painting your house. You only hmm. have to do it every so many years. It just has to be really well, expensive. Paint for a, a word for inside the tower. It is actually not painting. It's a, it's a special process that's inside the tower. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so I guess if we're going to move on to another part of this, is there any specific questions that Colleen and I need to, I mean, other than the things we've covered, because I've taken notes so far on what we've had, but, or do you want to maybe send your questions or thoughts to us, and then we can? Um, well, you know, I think under public safety, it's already been mentioned that we need to look at that cruiser. The other thing is, uh, this is where, to me, like the, the wages issue really is highlighted because mm -hmm. we, we shouldn't be projecting more in part-time wages for the police department. We should be figuring out staffing-wise how we don't need mm -hmm. part-time and, and, and overtime and, for that matter. And that's what we're trying um, to do. So that's an area where I think we should be able to tighten up that budget. Um, well, I had three budget requests mm -hmm. and I and these are just requests. I understand right now we have a deficit budget, but uh, I'll say them, I'd have to say them now. Yep. So planning commission is working on the comprehensive plan and um, 
Judy attended a, a workshop in which she learned about uh, the state of the art comprehensive plans, I guess. She could say more than I, which is uh, basically an online uh, product that uh, is much more user friendly and it allows lots of links and photographs and videos and things. And Planning Commission felt that that, that would be the way to go and that we we would need we made I mean we made up this number I think thirty thousand dollars so I'd like that request to be noted anyway that's the first one under the for planning planning commission. adding the thirty thousand yes okay and then you also saw the note that planning commission is not going to use the ten thousand that was requested for this year so that comes out of the commission's budget. <laughs> 15,000? 10,000. 10,000, yeah. Planning Commission had, had requested 10,000 for that purpose for this year, and it's not being used. Okay. So that, okay. Um, then I, I'm requesting that we start an affordable housing trust fund, um, and that is the term that's used nationally for funds that go toward affordable housing. And I requested that at $50,000, and that we could, uh, that the Village Managers Housing Advisory Board could come up with criteria for how that would be used, but basically anything that the village spends or provides in-kind services or equipment for affordable housing projects. And <coughs> third, um, Vicki Hennessy, and I believe she talked with Patty Bates, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, suggested that um, we apply for a modest fund for doing minor things for the conservation area that volunteers cannot do. So what I've suggested is that that be $2,500 a year for over a five-year period to accrue over that time period if it's not used, and that by the fifth year, I, I believe that we would have the development, the housing development plan for the glass farm, at which time we things might change in terms of con what happens on the conservation property and maybe the housing would be something different. Anyway, I'm asking for five years. And lastly, something I didn't write down is we, we've talked about the in-kind contributions that the village gives to nonprofit organizations, especially events. In line with what Brian has requested about itemizing things, I suggest that we have a line item I guess it would be called economic and community development that, and I don't know if it would be 30,000, 40,000, whatever it is approximately that we spend. Patty had worked up figures on that, so mm -hmm. I think we could, that it's, in other words, it's money we're already, we have been spending. We just haven't been itemizing it as a separate expense. Right, and then that again is, is a great way to think about the lodging tax and how we dedicate those funds so um, as a possibility um, I want to also add in I'm not convinced that we need to add 50,000 to the green space fund this year or next year if we have 205,000 in there already we have our commitment so uh, especially if we're thinking about affordable affordable housing line um, so I'm going to recommend taking that out of the budget this year oh. or next year. Yeah. See, you. you're welcome. I, I forgot we already had Can I ask yeah. a quick clarifying question about the affordable housing trust fund? Yeah. Um, do you envision that, does that also yeah. include a fund for affordable housing initiatives for village owned property or is that just for non village owned properties and initiatives related to affordable housing? Um, that is a good question because um, what the village co could contribute on village owned property is the property, the value mm -hmm. of the property. And I don't have an answer to that question. Okay. I think that needs to be thought through. And I think we can think that through, but I don't mm -hmm. have an answer. Thanks. And I have a, <clears throat> an object. I'll say okay. this is just for this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're not going to be. Doing, I, I'm, I'm just trying to think about the DCIC yeah, and yeah. yes, you know, yeah. I don't, yeah, thank you. So, um, Brian, you put 
uh, forward a, a plan a few weeks ago about uh, um, the village manager transition process, mm -hmm. and each of us um, has been given certain responsibilities. So uh, Marianne and Patty and I have been working on a, uh, a, a transition plan or a schedule. Um, and when that came up during the discussion about the overlapping salaries, I, I sensed some moans up here uh, when I said four to six weeks. Um, I don't know that that made it to the packet, the, the schedule that we've been talking about, but I think we need to decide, you know, are we going to expect that that transition be compressed to two weeks? Uh, we're looking at four weeks right now, is, is allowed to stretch. So what that budget item looks like depends on what we feel we can stomach in terms of a transition between the two positions. And we haven't come back to that. So I, I, I'm going to say, first of all, that Marianne and Kevin and I have looked at, you know, what's in those four weeks and there's detail and, and so I, it's pretty packed for the four weeks. Now there's some wiggle room, but keep in mind that that's still eight months away and right now there wasn't a whole lot on my schedule for June of next year quite yet, but it gets really full really fast. So I will do whatever you want, obviously, but there's a lot packed into the time already and I've already added a couple things that Marianne and Kevin don't know about because I thought about them after we met. So that's the first thing I want to say. Well, and I'll just say there, I think we can make the best decision if we see that mm -hmm. plan in writing mm -hmm. and we understand what the costs look like as well. And I mean, I think, you know, I mean, we've talked about, you know, moving forward every time we have a justice system initiative, every time we have a, you know, economic sustainability initiative, we need to factor in these costs for legal services and for salaries and things. So I, th I think that's just part of, you know, being right. responsible. Right. And the other thing I want to, again, reiterate, and, and I said this earlier in, in the meeting, but as Colleen has pointed out, you know, we're starting to get into those reserves. And so I understand we're going to go through the budget, we're going to make some changes to it. But you know, let's keep in mind that every time we add something and we don't compensate for it somewhere else, we're getting that much deeper into those no, reserves. Yes. I think and we're probably all so very aware of that. I, yeah. But I'm just, you know, trying to make sure everybody keeps that in mind because, you know, we presented a lot of infrastructure needs and, and, and these are needs. They're not, you know, for the most part wants. Um, and, and maybe some of them can be delayed and maybe some of them can't. But I just want everybody to keep that in mind. And, and I think that if this is, this is a great discussion that we're having tonight and it's very detailed. It's far more detailed than it has been in the last few years. I think we just need to schedule the work session because it needs to be devoted to budget. We have too many other things on the agenda at the meetings to be able to comprehensively concentrate I, I on the budget. So. I support that. And, and yet before we leave this topic, <laughs> Um, I did mention the DCIC and I realized that's probably a line item that we need to think about some budget. Um, it may be due to some restructuring, but there will be solicitor fees related to DCIC. There could be some staff costs. Um, we'd have to think about what that all might be, but I would think that next year there would be a, a need for a budget related to that if we're, as we move forward. Right. And we, we did finally find that 120000 mm -hmm. for economic development. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, right? And, yeah. That, that one's always been on the fund balance. Okay. Yeah. I just, we, oh, we weren't sure about that, but we've got that there. Yeah. yeah. So. It wasn't right. and, and with the, and, <laughs> so there's, there is money in that. Yeah. In, in, in right. that. In a, right. In that. Yeah, in an <laughs> economic <laughs> development. And but I mean, maybe right. it needs to be restructured a little bit to be pulled together into a budget related. And right. would the other entities contribute to the DCIC's budget? Yeah. That are, the other entities that are involved in the right. DCIC. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I can get questions from you through Patty, through email, if you, if you could really look at the capital part of the budget because that page will reflect this but our general fund hugely. If there are items in there like the car that we're talking about that needs off, um, if there's things that need pushed over. Now, 20, 2020 has a much bigger total 
of projects that need done than 2019, so we can't push too much. And I do believe that there's been a lot of these needs that have not been on the budget, trying to keep the budget nice and small, but now this huge infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. really needs to be addressed as best um, you can. Right. Thank you. Do, do you feel that you got our questions and additions and everything, or should we I, send I, them to you? I, you? I wrote down everything everybody was talking Patty about. Patty will help me with history, too, on some of the things. I'm not sure what um, <laughs> abbreviation-wise I'm learning. So, mm -hmm. And I can you. get, again, detailed information on any of the expenditures that right. we've had to compare. Well, and Colleen, I want to say I think you did a great job with the history that you had, and I mean, this really kind of teed up the discussion that we wanted to have, which, you know, as, as Patty noticed, I think we're all a lot more engaged this time around because I do believe we shouldn't be in that scenario that you described where we're digging into the general fund. Mm -hmm. And so part of this is we can tighten up some things, but part of it is things like paid parking that we need to start thinking about more seriously if we want to do these needs or wants or whatever they fall into so thank you thanks thank, thank you. you um okay yes uh designated community improvement corporation so this is the uh initiative to have coordinated discussions around uh community-wide planning with the township the school board antioch college the chamber getting everyone at the table. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to move into old business. And, and we're 20 yes. minutes behind schedule. Yes. So if we keep going, that means we'll be getting out of here about 10.30. Okay. But hopefully Unless we'll we wanna try to up. We'll try to catch up a little bit. Um, okay, so the justice system, but I, I think we needed to take that extra 10 minutes for the budget. So, okay. Um, Justice System Commission, I will lead this off. Would it make sense to take a break? Do you want to take a break? I think taking a break would be a nice We've still got some big topics. So. Okay. All right. Come back fresh. Okay. So why don't we take, why don't we take a five-minute break and come back at 9.02. Wow. It's that late already?
uh, reconvene and um, thank you. All right, good idea to take a little break, Marianne. Um, I think we're ready to talk about the Justice System Commission. And um, I'm going to lead off this discussion, and uh, my comments are pretty succinct. Um, we, uh, Judith and I, presented a one page follow up. Uh, this discussion is related to how do we continue the work for uh, a model justice system um, for the village. That's been one of our eight key goals. Um, and honestly, as I kind of processed this and really thought about like what, what was going to happen in the next year or two, I, I feel that council is on the same page with regard to the idea that we need to step back, assess, measure outcomes, figure out where we're going. So I think we're on agreement there. So then the question becomes, what is the mechanism to make sure that we continue with this work? Um, for me, and especially seeing what Marianne added in about the steps for evaluating, which I thought were really good, um, I am even more convinced that without having a body to lead this coordinated effort, um, I don't really see how it's going to move forward. Uh, council definitely does not have the capacity to handle a lot of the back end work. Um, we certainly make time on our agendas to discuss it. Um, I know from firsthand experience that uh, it's been great to have community organizations involved in this work, but when council has particular things that we need to happen, such as revamping our evaluation process to uh, recognize things such as um, community engagements. Um, those aren't the things we get back. Um, we often get back things that we've already worked on, such as our guidelines for village policing. But I think we need to be taking a lead on what are the things that we need to accomplish. And that's what we, I think we captured in that uh, one pager. Um, so that's what I really want to emphasize, but I have put forward the challenge um, that I think Judith and I are agreed on that if not a justice system commission, I think it's very important that we decide what is going to uh, take the place of that to continue this work. So uh, Judith, do you want to add anything? Um, well, I just want to read a little bit out of the commission proposal that we wrote just to remind particularly citizens of the purpose of a justice system commission, which uh, we uh, have written is to assist village council, the mayor, in supporting a village justice system that provides respectful service in the interest of justice for victims, respects civil liberties, is proactively anti-racist, and fights the criminalization of poverty and mental illness. Uh, it would be charged with making recommendations for policies and priorities that align the practices of the Yellow Springs Police Department and the Mayor's Court with our community values. So that is the purpose. Um, I appreciate uh, kind of the detail that Brian put in our uh, new, new kind of summary um, in terms of what activity would be happening in the next few months. We had a great conversation Lisa and I had a conversation with Vaughn Crandall, which, who is Beth Crandall's son, who grew up in Yellow Springs, who is working out in California, uh, is in the middle of uh, working with, you know, uh, police reform, uh, looking at issues of distrust and, tr and building trust between communities and police departments. Um, and he's been a great resource, and he's really emphasized the importance of um, really gathering an, an, the information on what's actually happening, what, are police off, our, what is our police off department doing, um, and then when you make a policy change, you know, really looking at the impact that it has uh, and so that you know, so you know if change is happening, uh, you have to be able to measure it. And he was very specific on that. And the council, if we're going to move forward with a commission or, or if the council decides they want to do something else, um, is going to have to be committed to it. Um, I mean, there has to be a strong commitment in um, 
there, one of the things that's clear is that there needs to be some, uh, a shared conversation that includes the community, the council, the YSPD, and the village manager, and the mayor. Um, and I don't think, the justice system task force didn't really, I don't think, uh, do that and moving forward we would need to be able to do that so that if um, so that we know so this alignment has to you know mean under really better understanding um, I was looking at some of the resources um, around you know this idea of building trust between police and communities um, and there's the National League of Cities um, there's an uh, organization called the Police Foundation, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. There's a lot of real effort going on around the country uh, that we can learn from. And one of the big emphasis uh, is on police community partnerships um, that the, the language in this one document uh, uh, talked about the co-production of safety, which necessitates a strong focus on equity transparency, accountability, shared information, and changes in how this is focusing at police are trained, evaluated, and promoted. And um, one of the big emphases is that it, this isn't just, you know, police departments do not, cannot, and are not able to do this by themselves. They really need community leaders to be very engaged, and they want to need the community to be engaged. Uh, so. Obviously, uh, we, uh, this is our proposal is that we develop a commission, that we create a commission, and want to hear further from the rest of council on their continued thinking on the issue. Okay. Thanks, Judith. Mm -hmm. uh, comments from council? So, <clears throat> would it be too much of a stretch to expect uh, HRC to take on some of the existing or outstanding responsibilities um, of the JSTF? Without a commission? Or you're asking well, if they could play a role? Well, the HRC is a commission, of course, we all know yeah, that. Yeah, 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 without but, a justice system commission, you're saying they would take up the work? Yeah, I'm just asking, is that too far of a stretch, and, and might that be, um, a consideration. One thought I have related to that is um, I think it's really important, and this was uh, confirmed with our conversation with Vaughn and Beth Crandall, um, is we need to make sure we have certain expertise working on this. And I understand, you know, we've talked about other looser configurations that could gather that expertise, um, which doesn't mean there isn't a place for, you know, diversity in terms of thinking, but personally for me, I want to make sure that this commission is, is populated with folks that really understand this work because a lot of it's pretty complicated. I mean, Beth Crandall's an example of someone that's shown that she's got that background. Um, I'm not sure the Pat Deweese would be interested in continuing, but she's done a lot of work. Um, so I think it's really important, and Ellis Jacobs, you know, that we have some of those folks. Um, I, I'm not sure that, you know, unless we're reconfiguring the HRC, that that expertise is, is there at this point. But I do think there's, there's a complementary role that should be played. And, and, you know, I've seen some things here. For example, the, the idea of how we might action this uh, uh, citizen review board. I'm open to that being a role that HRC plays. But this is, to me, a, a perfect example of I want, if we're going to have a commission, they need to have the expertise to be able to evaluate that citizen review board, not another group that figures that out. I mean, we want people that can tackle these problems and then give us a solution. And, and that may very well be the HRC. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate the idea of this collaborative alignment. I really think that's going to be important as this body moves forward. I certainly was very influenced by the conversation with Vaughn Crandall um, because while, while a commission can extend 
the capacity of the council, this work can't be abdicated to a commission. Unless the council remains very strong with vision setting, I believe we won't be able to really make a change for our community. And that, I think, is really important. So I, sometimes I feel like our commission reports, they're at the end of the meeting, we're all exhausted. <clears throat> this can't be just the last, oh, and that, this, the commission didn't know that, 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 and we want to be adjourned. <clears throat> if this commission is agreed upon, I, I will want to see evidence that it's front and center early in our agendas and that, that the council's committed to the work. Yeah, I really like those comments. And I'll say one thing, um, the uh, articles about building trust that were shared by Beth um, really resonated with me. And especially the comments about how um, citizens have to have trust in the village as an entirety, right? And, and it, it really solidified for me why this needs to be, continue to be a priority and commitment for us. So yeah, I think that's a very good point. Marianne? Yeah. Um, I had a really good conversation with John Hempling <laughs> last weekend, and he helped me um, think about this more deeply and also understand some of the uh, issues that the commission could and should be working on or whatever group. But one thing I realized, which I hadn't quite gotten before, is there's a big distinction between this work, whether it's a commission, task force, whatever, and the work of our other commissions. Because this work is about changing how the village government functions, how <coughs> policing or the justice system. Whereas the environmental commission, oh, you know, may, we're going to say don't use pesticides. Or the art commission say we're going to put up art in the hallway. But it's not fundamentally looking at how we, the village government, function. And so I think that that was one reason why it was so difficult to do. Not only have, have we not done it, and not many places are doing it, but we're really looking in on ourselves. And that gets to, I think, the, what Judith and um, Brian were talking about, about working with the police, with the mayor, and with one thing John and I talked about was having the back and forth happening between council and the commission. So it's not just running off doing something and come back to council. Mm -hmm. But you know, I feel like I am at my limit in terms of work. And I don't know, maybe other council members have lots of free time. But so I'm going to ask who will, if, if we do establish it as a separate commission, who is going to be the lead council person? Um, so, uh, I'd like Lisa to do it if she is willing and has the time, and I would be willing to be the alternate if our uh, new council member is, is not that person. Um, but I feel strongly enough that, that I will step up to fill a spot if, uh, if we don't have somebody else. So. So that's the first I've heard of that. <laughs> yep, I um, just I decided it this hello weekend. Hello, everyone. Um, but I've been attending. I can, I'm, honor, I I'm can actually go, honored way. because I've been involved with Justice System Task Force since before I was <coughs> elected. Um, but I, I can only say yes to that if I get relief from some of the other things that I'm doing, like the DCIC work, you know, which is also a really big load. But I think a, for me, I would, I would love to do that, but I also have these other skills. So I think a lot of it has to do with who comes forward to fill this really huge role, J Judith, that you filled. It's very big shoes to fill. And I think, I think a lot of how we do our commission roles is going to depend on who steps in. And we may have to, some of us move around. So I'm, I'm open to moving around, but I, let's see who comes in. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, thank you. I think that's I'll a, just, a yeah. well, Let me just follow up. Okay. We do need people to help 
groups. But anytime we start a new commission, not only does it take a lot of time to get the people in place and then get adjusted to each other, but it takes that council member and the uh, alternate a lot of time, which is at least one meeting, well, a couple meetings a month probably and other things, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing is I am very committed to whatever we end up calling some kind of a complaint process. Um, and I'm still committed to starting it even if it's imperfect at first. And I think that's a different function than this commission. So right. I do I think it's separate. Mm -hmm. So I just have a thought, if I could throw this out, just listening to the, the different conversations that are going on. Um, as Lisa's just mentioned, there's the complaint process part of this. As Kevin has mentioned, and, and, and Brian, there's the advisory board part of this. And then there's the third part, which is continuing those initiatives that haven't yet had the full measure of. Uh, so, and then I hear Mary Ann saying, let's do this evaluation piece and see where we stand. So, just throwing this out as a possibility that Lisa continues to work with the um, mediation <coughs> program on the complaint intake and resolution piece. If the HRC possibly fills part of the advisory board piece, and then I'm wondering if as the, if through the evaluation process and time and as topics come up, maybe additional people could be added to subcommittees of the HRC to work on the specific initiatives like you could bring Beth Crandall in to do some analysis with two members of the HRC and a couple of up John or whomever you know to bring in on a particular topic and work on this particular topic you know just to kind of combine all of the resources into the into one place well one thing I will say is that Vaughn really emphasized the importance of developing expertise over time mm -hmm. and some of that we've done mm -hmm. so I'm not saying that a piecemeal approach couldn't work, but that just makes me a little bit nervous yeah. I mean, about you could always, the coordinated aspect. You could always create another commission down the road if it was something that didn't work, um, but in the meantime, the work is continuing on. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, it comes back to the council, and council says, okay, this just isn't working the way we want it to. This, Let's do this next step. I mean, really, we're talking about changing culture. This is not going to happen piecemeal. I'll tell you that right now. I mean, the thing is, this is not a new body. We have had a task force, and we've all done a huge amount of work, and I know I have. So I know I'm stepping off a of council, but that doesn't mean there's a new council member coming in. This isn't an additional body. It's, this, it's, it's carrying on that work. But it's a little less of a hothouse uh, kind of environment because it's not a task force that was trying to get so much done in this constrained period of time and in fact you know the way uh, Brian and I have laid out the next year is really spending time looking back slowing down take us let's slow down a little bit let's look back we're gonna you know but I thought there was an interesting in one of the articles that I I put those two articles about building trust in the packet um, and there was a, a little statement by the president of what's called the Police Foundation, I assume it's an organization, um, where he says, and he's talking as a police officer, uh, the enf enforcement is not the core of our work. Harm reduction, sustaining healthy communities, and working with youth, li youth lie at our heart. We must co-produce safety with the community. I mean, we're talking about you know, a, a change that's going to take, I think, ongoing focus. And we want to improve what, what JSTF did not do very successfully, which is really find a way to communicate effectively with uh, the police department. I don't think we were very effective at that. We did some good work. Um, and so I think to move forward, though, this piecemeal thing, I think, is, is not going to go anywhere effectively. Yes. Okay. Right. Twenty minutes, and right. we're going to have more to 
discussion? Yes, we are. So I, thank you. And I, I was just going to say, um, I think this has been a good discussion. Um, this has kind of, I think, moved us forward into deliberating a little bit more about what makes sense. Um, we are going to have probably two more discussions about this because we're slated to make a, de a decision at the November 19th meeting. Um, but if there are citizen comments that uh, you're really burning, if you could just keep them uh, brief, uh, we'll welcome those at this point. Okay. But I think otherwise what you are hearing is that we're thinking about this really seriously and, and we do want further input, uh, including, you know, anything in writing. Uh, and we will have more time, I think, in our, our next discussion for citizen input. I, I'm a little confused about what you're saying, the timeline of decision making. Um, I thought we were going to have a, like. So we're going to, we're, we're slated at the next meeting to talk about the uh, review board, but I think it might make more sense to continue this conversation. And then we have committed to making a decision at your last meeting, uh -huh. if not before. So, okay, so it sounds like we're ready to move into the Housing Advisory Board update, yeah. Marianne. Yeah. Okay, well, it's almost 9.30, and I'm gonna not take the 20 minutes, but what I would like to do is at our next meeting, I would like to have the housing discussion happen earlier in the meeting so we have, so we can, spend more quality time on it. Mm -hmm. So what I will say is that we are working through a process in the housing initiative. And if you remember, we developed a values and goals, a values um, and vision statement. And the next piece is to set housing goals. The next piece after that is to look at the strategies on how to meet the housing goals. Now the, the meat of this process is the strategies. And at this point, strategies are very broad, including having marketing plans to using the glass farm for affordable housing, to having a housing trust fund, to uh, we could go on and on in terms of what kind of strategies. So that's really where the hard work happens in the strategies. But what, what the advisory board did was we after Patrick Bowen made the presentation to council about goals, which was fairly complex, we invited a group of stakeholders, realtors, builders, uh, Home Inc., uh, the, someone from the schools, the college to come, and we showed them the Bowen presentation and we asked three questions. We said, are these reasonable goals? Um, what, if you think they're reasonable or regardless, what do you think it would take to reach these goals? And what kind of housing units do you think are most in demand, most needed? And we had a very, big, very rich discussion. And some of the things that came out of the discussion, I hadn't really thought about. For example, I hadn't thought about the need to, to think about a marketing plan for this. Now, others, of course, who do marketing had, but I hadn't. Um, and uh, uh, an important thing I think that was raised was about our infrastructure. Okay, if we're going to be building more housing units, whether it's within the um, existing village where we have neighborhoods or whether it's like in the glass farm, what is the state of our infrastructure? What are we going to have to do to have the infrastructure be able to uh, meet the housing that we would put there? So that. The discussion we had el elicited a number of very useful topics. Getting back to the housing goals, because that's all I want to really focus on. Most of the people at that meeting thought that the goal of having 500, building 500 units in five to 10 years was, was, was too, uh, too, uh, too much of a stretch. And I've listed all the reasons in this report why they thought that. However, when we had our housing advisory board meeting, we decided that it, we thought it was still worth basically having that goal. Only we said, why don't we change that goal to 300 to 500 units in 10 to 15 years, sort of spread it out more. You mean now, 200 to 300 units? 300 to 500 units, what did I say? 
That's what I thought that was the original, but then the you original guys said was 200. 500. Right. In so this is 300. Five maybe five I misspoke. What I, I'll say this again. Get it right. What what we are recommending at this point is we think of 300 to 500 units in 10 to 15 years. In other words, we sort of scaled back a little bit. We we gave ourselves a bit of a range and we increased the time frame. Um, and what we are suggesting is that we use Bowen's figures as the basis for our goals, but in, a, in the narrative of our housing plan, we wouldn't have, that, that would be like an appendices, that's what we would refer to. So what it would mean would be that approximately 80, or excuse me, 60% of these housing units that we will be creating will be rental and 40 home ownership. In other words, it's weighted toward rental. And then in terms of the home, in terms of the rental units themselves, it's weighted toward very low, low and moderate, with some, some upper, but very low and low. In terms of the home ownership units, it's, I'll say, low, moderate, and by that I mean 80% of area median income to 100%, moderate, which really, moderate, you could say 80% to 120, but let's say moderate 100% to 120, and then upper income is above 120. And I'm not going to dig down into all those figures, but that would be the general, um, the general gist of, of how we would go. Um, I'm just going to stop there and see if people have questions, concerns. And what I'd like to do is come back with a, something written for our next meeting for the council to adopt. It's, it's more the, goal, the goals, the goal. you mean? Yep. The goal. I mean, I think this document's excellent. Um, the one thing I will, the, the one red flag I had was the idea of, what was it, um, not worrying as much about um, like lowering efficiency, energy efficiency standards, especially when I think about the fact that Home Inc. Um, is, you know, committed in their affordable housing to doing that. But anyway, that was just the small detail that, um, that but everything else, I, right. And I knew it was just a summary of a suggestion, but that's the one I guess I, I wouldn't want us to have in our goals personally. Um, but I love everything the, else. The suggestion was to, uh, to tr that we need starter homes, modest starter homes. Some of those homes would be having subsidy, some of them might wouldn't be, but that we look at ways to draw down that cost so that we can actually produce houses from 150 to 175,000 that someone could actually buy mm -hmm. without subsidy maybe, mm -hmm. possibly. Mm -hmm. Any so, other yeah, so I think I think this is great. Um, you know, it's obviously it's a good segue into the homing discussion. But so I'm just wondering if uh, you know when we look at a collaborative sort of teamwork type approach, um, you know, if homing does what they're planning to do, uh, that in theory should uh, make available, you know, some currently occupied homes we, we presume available for sale for rent. So I just want to uh, ensure that we are considering that and what the future is going to look like because uh, apparently, you know, you can build six homes and have a waiting list of 100 people and, and so we're looking at 54, I'm sure that the list is probably longer. Um, so again, just, just have that comprehensive look and, and include what, what we know is going on in the area as well. And I thought about the housing, uh, needs or the housing assessment advisory board and I don't know the details but in Dayton and this this might not be anybody we want to work with some developer it was in the news some they had gotten the approval to build hundreds of apartments somewhere in the Dayton area and then they just pulled out yeah I saw that article. okay so I don't know again if that's somebody we want to absolutely stay away from or if they're if they're just like they're ready to do some work and cool. just need some place to do it uh, so I don't really know if that's something that anybody 
has, has uh, looked into, but I thought about that. Uh, so again, I think it's great. Again, just we, we, we're going to have to work together one way or the other, so just let's do it intentionally. Okay. Lisa? Okay. Yeah, and I also appreciated the clarity of the document and in particular the importance of a master plan. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think wrapping our wrapping our arms around the different real estate plays and the different stakeholders, I think it's really important. So thank you for stressing that. I, I also was glad to see a consideration of apartments on the glass farm property um, because I'm, what I've been hearing from community members is a concern about, about um, larger apartment buildings on small pieces of land. So I was glad to see that there. Yeah, that, Thank that you. will take some research yeah, to see, I see that. what mm -hmm. would Cause trade the soil. off financial. Yeah. And further geotechnical work. Too. Yes, right. right. Okay, well, excellent work. And uh, I mean, honestly, I thought based on the detail of the writing, I mean, it was just, it's pretty clear what we need to do next. So. Good. Well, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. You got my support. <laughs> All right. We're going to move into new business. And um, Denise, why don't you tell us about this uh, PUD request? Well, and let me, I just want to, you know, reemphasize, you know, the, the whole point of, you know, Denise's detail, which is at this point, I think our question should be about if we have some major issue with this not being explored, right? right. So, because we will still have to review um, based on the work the Planning Commission does, whether this is uh, the right project for the village. So, at this point, we're really looking at, like, I mean, it's just, just, is this untenable? Don't waste your time. So, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, so based on what I read, I would say, yeah, keep moving forward. But the 27500 is that the only cost to the village? Mm. Uh, well, I'm not going to answer that. That, that is for the sewer line mm -hmm. that recommended. That is an infrastructure that will have to be done on that system. Uh, the rest of it is considered AD construction, and I think those costs are in here as well. And does everyone understand what AD construction is? Just like make ready type stuff? Well, yes and no. For the transformer and all that, then the developer would be responsible mm -hmm. for the cost. Uh, the infrastructure, the sewer needs reline, but if this project goes ahead that will have to move to the front of our line that's the reason why we wanted to put that cost in there up front mm -hmm. because it's cracked it's working right now there's low flow but when we add that to that property that would make sure that we have to have that in there before this goes in there because you gotta have you gotta be able to reline it with less sewage going down the line mm -hmm. well isn't the only other point of aid to construction that we are making sure that we do it to our specs, but they pay. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. So we, we would order, like for instance, Johnny would order the transformer 
we would make sure the transformer is properly installed, but that cost would then be invoiced back to the developer mm -hmm. to be reimbursed to the village. Yes. Can I correct that? The invoice is paid prior to the material well, yeah. and the labor being done. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way it's been done since I've been here. It is construction to pay before the village is out any money. Okay. So. Cool. Okay. Um, and, all right. And I just want to reemphasize what Brian said, that the decision tonight is for council to decide if this is preliminary approval for this to go to the Planning Commission and go through the whole process. You're not, you're not approving the development. You're not approving the zoning change. You're simply saying you're willing to consider it when it comes back. Okay. Because the Planning Commission has not gone through their standards yet. Right. Um, okay, I think Emily wants to say something. Thank you, Denise. Come on up, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily Seibel, Executive Director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. It's late, but I have to read this little statement our development team collaborated on today with regards to infrastructure. So I will read it verbatim since they're not here. Um, based on the estimate of $10,000 of aid to construction for the water main and water meter tab, and the estimate of $19,000 for the aid to construction for the electric needs, it appears likely that the, that the development budget can reasonably absorb these costs. The Ohio Housing Finance Agency places a significant emphasis on cost control when awarding projects, and cost per unit is considered as part of the competitive scoring. That said, we want to do everything we can to be good partners with the village, and as we create our total development cost budget for the project, we will consider assisting the village with the relining of the sewer costs as well, even though, though that's off-site, uh, so long as we feel that we will still be competitive in the 2019 9% low-income housing tax credit application round. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? So I think we need to take a vote on this. So all in favor of this project being explored further, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, thank you. Okay, Patty, anything you wanna highlight in your manager's report? No, unless anybody has any questions about anything that's in there, um, I think it's pretty clear. Okay. Uh, Chris? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Johnny's. Yes, Johnny. I, I did get an update at 5 o'clock. Um, on the paving? Will, um, they will start grinding on Corey Street, East Limestone, and Railroad Street on Wednesday. Uh, the Bryan Center uh, Street Department will be working on the Bryan Center parking lot starting tomorrow, replacing the front three catch basins, hopefully to be done by Thursday. Entrance to the drop box will be available, but it will be a one lane into the Bryan Center. Okay, okay so um, work on the catch basins tomorrow and grinding. Tomorrow, Thursday, and then grinding Thursday by the And then repaving starts. As soon as they rain quit. Okay. All right. Would you okay. help me remember to put out a press release about that tomorrow, please? Yeah. You can use your uh, status as a uh, Facebook administrator. Uh, All right. Thank you, Johnny. Chris? The, uh, the, uh, Ellis and I finished the surveillance ordinance Friday. Uh, we just have to do final proof. Uh, he's gone through it. He's comfortable. Um, I expect that, uh, that staff and, and other groups will have that by Wednesday to review. And uh, if council so desires, I think it's beyond the agenda for the next council. Okay. Thank you. Judy? Nope, nothing. Okay. Uh, board and commission reports. Anything that council members would like to highlight? Um, I just wanted to point out the energy board is working on pulling together materials to match up with the um, Roundup program. And actually, we got an email cool. from Dan Rudolph while we sat here tonight with some of that information in it. I haven't had a chance to look at it. Excellent. Yet. I also um, wanted to mention Mary Ann's idea that the energy board. Um, do uh, a maybe one page document that highlights a couple things. One of them is kind of a extension of what Patty did with our uh, energy contracts. And I guess more specifically, I'd like to understand like 
what it would mean to sell our electric grid. Not that I think that we are thinking about doing that, but I think there are some simple things. Uh, it seems not practical to me. I also know I've heard before that even if we sell our energy contracts, we're ultimately responsible. So if somebody else reneges, and then, and this was Mary Ann's idea, but the other thing is, um, I would like there to be some analysis about why we've made the sustainable choices that we've made mm -hmm. as a village. And then, this, and then this highlights, you know, also that we have things that offset a cheaper DPNL, such as local service and the ability to address problems a lot quicker, which I think will feed into what the Economic Sustainability Commission wants to do. So, I, I think so why, why it's important to be moving toward renewable use resources yep. for our electricity, the value. I, yeah, so I, I know you want to look specifically at our, at our choices, <coughs> yeah. but I was going to say all you have to do is look at the news last week and that storm that hit Florida. Right. And, uh, <laughs> that, you know, we've, been, we've had more than one uh, citizen, citizen raise these issues, yes. Okay. Complain about. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, just to be clear, you want, the, for instance, just to take the two briefs that I did on the different energy and have the energy board e expand them as to the reasoning on the green right. portfolio with yeah. that? Right. Okay. And just, you know, a piece about why communities make these kinds of decisions, because I think we are on good. the right track. Uh, absolutely, we are. And so, you're going to take that to EB, Judith? Yeah, are you coming? Can you send me the two briefs? Yes, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I was going to say, me, if you want to send the briefs out to everybody, that'd be. And th even though this was not in, I don't think in the um, HRC report, I'm, I'm back channeling some conversations um, with HRC. Uh, Judith says I'm a little while a phrase she used, um, and I just sent you an email. And I've sent a few others of you emails um, about co-production of public safety. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we're starting to work with a couple of folks, Rachel Isaacson being one of them, the, the Antioch student. Uh, she's starting to look at uh, co-production of public safety. And, and I've been working with uh, Cindy Seek, who's doing that in the medical field, and she's been sharing information with us. So I, I just think that's an important phrase that didn't get a lot of airtime. But that co-production is is, is uh, something that you start to hear more and more yeah. about. And those documents that uh, Beth Crandall uh, mm -hmm. submitted mentioned that too. It is really okay. cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sweet. Um, uh, Marian? Yeah, um, I would like to let Tom Dietrich come up for a minute, just to briefly discuss the letter that we are suggesting come from council, which I think may probably need to be tweaked given the EPA response. Could, yes. could you come up to the microphone? Yes. <clears throat> Tom Dietrich, uh, Environmental Commission member. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, as Marion mentioned, um, we, the Environmental Commission put together a recommended letter for council's review to the EPA we based have on the Brene um, proposed cleanup plan. Um, since that time, uh, Marsha Walgreen submitted a letter, I think, that you all reviewed, had a chance, they had a chance to review, that showed that US EPA has responded to Bernays' plan and has significant comments, substantial comments, many of them reflecting the comments that we had proposed in our letter. Um, so, uh, and then Marsha also pro uh, provided some additional comments that I think might help us to reframe that letter. And uh, so we'd like a chance to redirect and revise this letter and uh, still submit. And you know, I think it would still be very important to submit to US EPA and show the village's interest in getting a strong cleanup and thorough cleanup mm -hmm. completed. So mm -hmm. that's what we're asking. And I just wanted to see if anyone well, I just want to say the letter that we've already seen, I thought was excellent. And I agree uh, tweaking it based on, you know, some of the, the updates that we've got makes sense. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I have a few things that I'd like to, so I'd like to review the final draft, um, but it sounds like we all will. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think this is really important that we submit. 
Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sounds good. Awesome. So, uh, so what are we are we targeting for having that for our November fifth meeting? We have a EC meeting this Thursday, so okay. probably that can be done. Okay. And will that that should still be timely since they've been sitting yes. on this for yeah. ten years? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> with the US EPA providing that kind of stuff, Renee is now going to take it back and start yeah. figuring out how they're going to. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, just to get it out there, I, I'd like to also, part of the framing, um, highlight a little bit more about how integral that piece of land is to our overall village, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. So, and, and so I thought we could have a little bit more about that. So, okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Great. Oh, was good. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect. Appreciate okay. your support. Right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thank you. Tom. Okay. Um, Lisa, did you want to highlight anything? Um, and, well, I think for our Art and Culture Commission, it was one of those meetings where we were wrapping up a lot of different uh, grants. We're moving forward on the jungle mural renovation, and we're grateful to the Community Foundation um, that really stepped in and, and took the lead on the uh, vast majority of the funds for the jungle mural. Um, and as far as economic sustainability, um, we had a very productive meeting working on uh, strength, weakness, weaknesses, opportunity, threat, what's called a SWOT analysis, starting to try to uh, pull apart some of the attractors for uh, Yellow Springs as a business location. So it's, it's complicated work, but uh, we, uh, I'm looking forward to sharing those minutes with you at the next meeting. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else about boards and commissions? Well, you know, we've got the uh, uh, Manager's Advisory Committee on CAP. I think we might be calling it the Technology Advisory mm -hmm. <laughs> Board now. Uh, but someone wrote, I think, Marianne, you wrote and asked about the website, so the Village's website. Someone asked about the Village's website. So we are looking at that. Uh, we're in discussions about the rickety old cart and <laughs> projector. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, that's what it's called. <laughs> that's, what we'll, that's what we'll continue to call it. Um, Thank you for coming. And, and again, there, we are starting discussions in HRC about the uh, Community Advisory Board and what roles we could play and some other things. So, yeah, just wanted to throw those out there. Cool. Okay. So I just want to say we are exactly on our agenda schedule right now, 9.50 for that? future agenda items. And uh, so do we have any comments on those before we... Uh, close up our meeting. I've got a number of things down that I'm not sure whether you want them. Do you want the solar information sheet and, and a discussion perhaps next time? Do you want that added? Or is that just something you wanted in the manager's report? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that we need, well, I guess we can decide if we need a discussion. So the first thing is getting that report together, I think, in the manager's report. Okay. okay. Um, and do you want the conversation? Uh, no, sorry, resolution for the sculpture placement? sculpture. Yeah, I guess a resolution of commitment, yes. Um, village manager transition plan? Uh, yeah, if you guys are ready to put that in the packet, that'd be great. Well, I sent it to you guys to review, and nobody responded to me, so. Um, sorry. Um, I did it's, I mean, have a minor comment, but I'll, I think we're good, Patty. Okay. okay. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, honestly, I think as long as we discuss it in one of the next two meetings, we're fine. So we can kind of see where, what the schedule looks like. Okay. okay. Anything else? Mary, I to, to Renee. Yep. We'll bring the letter to Renee. And also, I guess the, we'll do a resolution for goals. So that would come under housing goals. Okay. So yeah. Resolution. Under. Yeah, so that'll... And we'll make sure that, that that's... Earlier. So should we make that a special report? Okay. To make it earlier? Well, well but you report bring it as a that. resolution? Is that what you're saying? Well, you I don't... Oh, oh, yeah, if we make it a resolution, it can be yeah. in legislation. Yeah, right. Okay, that's good. Okay, so that's earlier. All right, anything else? Uh, well, I had written down for that one. Okay. Um, I wonder, Brian, about the DCIC ordinance at that meeting. We still haven't really had some of the conversations, right. and we in our last meeting we talked about doing sort of a cross map of values right. for and the different stakeholders. Given how busy the meeting is, I think we could pull it off. Yes. 
I um, agree. Because I, I do think, based on that meeting we had, we want to we want to prep a little bit more for right. those other meetings, yes. Um, also, I don't want to have anyone think I'm turning down the knob on the Citizen Advisory Board proposal, but uh, Marianne and I have some conversations that we're trying to schedule. And in light of everything that's going on with housing and also the commission, I'd be willing to let that push out also. Okay, great. Marianne, do you agree? Yeah, and I think we said that we would bring yeah. back the justice system yeah let that come in first and is the ESC special report I have no idea what that is yeah I, I thought that was you reporting out on the so you know, talking about right so we did <laughs> we we are starting to work on that fourth goal about marketing the land currently but formerly known as the CBE um, we are going to need to talk about budget related to that, but I don't think we're quite ready to have a special report. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, well, that would, I mean, if we, you know, are not doing citizen advisory board, we don't have anything to talk about with council open seat, ESC special report, DCIC. But, but we're but, putting another, we're putting the commission. But, back right, but the commission will continue. And then we'll have more time for the housing goals. Um, I mean, that looks like a pretty healthy agenda mm -hmm. so um, the surveillance ordinance I don't know if it surveillance yeah, yes on that's on there yes we have that on there um, okay do you, great just one last thing do yes. you are you still contemplating a work session for your budget and if so that doesn't need to be on here necessarily but it does mean I need to email everyone and start working on when that could happen if here truly um, yeah I think we should I think we should look at maybe a two-hour budget session where we can dig in on some of these things. Okay. I don't know if he answered. Yeah. I didn't see that. Either. Okay, so let's let's say three hours, um, and uh, and look at when that could happen. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. All right. Great. Very good discussions tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone. And with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I can't believe it's November.